Uh, let's start. Uh, just before we proceed, uh, G4S has given us a document, a thick document uh, that answers uh, questions put to them with some annexures. I think uh, it will be prudent that we allow members time to go through this thick document. It will not be processed. We won't deal with it today. Uh, we will find another time if there is a need to, to further engage with it. Honorable Horn. Yeah, my apologies, Chair, and you did ask us last night to confirm whether the, the list was completed, but I think uh, also based on the interactions today, the one thing that's not included here is uh, details on whether uh, Broadway was used to full capacity on the night of of the event. So if we can request through you that we get that information as well in the very near future, please. Uh, Mr. Grunewald, is he still around? You got, you got that, okay. Thank you very much. Now let's proceed to DCS. Uh, DCS is led by the Minister, Minister uh, Lamula and the De Deputy Minister Nkosi Olomisa. We will allow the minister to, as the leader of the delegation, to speak. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Honorable uh, uh, Chairperson, uh, the Minister of Police, uh, the Deputy Minister of Correctional Services, the Inspecting Judge, uh, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee, the National Commissioner for Correctional Services, uh, the National Commissioner for the South African Police Service, and uh, all honorable members and uh, members of the media and the public at large. Let me, from the onset, uh, honorable chairperson, um, convey my sincere um, welcoming of this uh, process by yourselves. Uh, up to so far since yesterday, hence um, myself and Minister Kele understood its importance, hence we have been sitting here for the past uh, two days because we believe the information here is insightful. It could also help us on our responsibilities. I also want to convey my gratitude to, to the SAPS, uh, Crime Intelligence, and all the officials of the uh, Correctional Service uh, Track and Tracing Team who helped to bring the fugitives back to South Africa, all the countries in the SADC region, in particular Tanzania. Uh, that led to the arrest of the two fugitives that have been now brought back to our country. And I must state that um, the behavior by the Tanzanian authorities has been very exemplary. Um, and it does show that on matters of um, uh, immigration laws, extradition, mutual legal assistance, while we also have to submit uh, completed papers and documents, you also rely on the political will of the requested country. And I think Tanzania has uh, displayed uh, that magnificently where there were issues of clarity. They requested that we send to them the information and uh, all that information was then used at the end to say the process has been concluded and conclu uh, in terms of the Tanzanian laws. I also want to take this opportunity, uh, Chairperson, to, to apologize to the victims of the convicted rapist, uh, Mr. Tabo Pesta, and to all the people of South Africa that uh, this dangerous uh, criminal was let loose in the public by the G4S uh, officials. And as DCS, we take full responsibility for this as we are the custodian of the Correctional Services Act and we are the people doing so on behalf of the people of South Africa. The people of South Africa don't know G4S as the custodian of these services. So it's us who must take this responsibility. It is the first of its kind, uh, Chairperson, incident that we had to deal with. 
uh, of this nature, uniqueness and magnitude. But uh, with your indulgence, Chairperson, before I go to the matter itself and before I request the National Commissioner to come in to give the detailed presentation, I just want to give a, a brief background of the setup of the private-public partnership, relationship between public uh, partnership and the Department of Correctional Services so that the society understand uh, this matter. During 1997, the Department of Correctional Services um, uh, entered uh, the processes of uh, looking for, for, for bidders to design, construct, finance, and operate prisons. And this le was led by the Department of Public Works in collaboration with the Department of Finance. This was aimed at acquiring additional accommodation, bed spaces due to the overcrowding in our facilities, and to learn best practices which will in turn be rolled over to other DCS facilities in ensuring that inmates are treated in human environment while they are being rehabilitated. At the time, two models were considered. The Asset Procurement Operational Partnership Systems, called APOPS, and the Procurement and Operational Partnership Systems, which was called POPS. I will no longer speak about POPS because POPS, there was an award uh, to a, a, a company called Gijima, but it was not proceeded with. Only the APOPS was proceeded with. And in APOPS is where we find the Mangaung Correctional Facility and where we also find Kutama Sintumul, which is the second uh, private prison in South Africa. In terms of the written agreement concluded between the Department of Correctional Services and the Bloemfontein contracts now that we are dealing with, on the 24th of March 2000, the concession agreement, Bloemfontein Co Co uh, uh, Correctional Contracts PTYLTD BCC operates the Mangaung Correctional Center as a pu public private partnership correctional center under section 103 and 112 of the Correctional Services Act. The expenditure payment made to date since 2001 to 2021 or 2022 financial year is 7.7 .7 billion rands. The projection until the end of the contract is about 2.8 2 uh, Two billion and fifty-two million and eight hundred and forty-one thousand four hundred and twenty-seven rands. So that is what will take us up until the end of the of the contracts. I heard honourable members were asking how much, what will this cost, and so forth. We are paying a, a number of five million rands a month to for this facility. With regard to the Kutama in one, uh, the amount that has been spent since inception. It is an amount of 8.9 billion rands of that contract. And the department is paying an amount of about 44 million rands per month. Honorable members were raising an issue whether there was value for money or not, and what is the situation? And an assessment was done in 2002 by the National Treasurer. That assessment found that DCS got value for money in terms of infrastructure. And I think that is a point Honorable Horn was referring to. Indeed, there's excellent infrastructure. It cannot be debated. However, the department is experiencing significant affordability constraints in meeting its contractual obligations in relation to the two uh, PPP uh, prisons. But we have a contract, we must honor it. And that is what is happening. What is the prison population in our country? The approved accommodation is 108 and 804,000. And the inmate population um, at the last date of checking, 28th of March, was 157,135 uh, sentenced. And um, 100, that is the whole prison population. Sentence is 100,587. These are sentenced inmate. 56,431. These are remand detainees. 117, these are the state patients, the patients of the president. Zero involuntary mental health care users, as reported 
on the 28th of March 2023, which translates to an overcrowding level at that date of 44%, 44.42%. The total number of inmates detained in private prisons is 5,952, and that being Kuntama Sintimula, 3,024 inmates, and 2,928, that is Mangau. It translates to about 3.7%. The presentation by the National Commissioner will cover um, the following. As you will have seen, uh, Honorable Chair, that while we are going to take the nation into confidence, and some of the matters will beg your indulgence to exercise restraint on some of the information that we we'll believe might jeopardize ongoing police investigations and the court processes, but we will endeavor to provide all the information that we believe the committee must be able to, to use. The, the topics that are going to be covered is, firstly, the, which I have already covered some, an overview of the pu private public partnership, the cost incurred, the bed capacity, the number of security incidents at the facility in Mangaung, the number of disputes with operating company to date, and the dispute resolution process, a profile of the offender in question, uh, Mr. Tabo Pesta, the sequence of events as outlined in the DCS investigation, the findings of the DCS investigation, the recommendation of the DCS investigative report, the steps taken after receiving the final recommendations, an outline of the legal remedies available to the Department of Correctional Services in relation to the concession contract, the internal consequence management process implemented to date, we also table what should be an action plan as we move forward, what we believe could help us to remedy this situation. I also want to deal with this matter <coughs> of the information received from the inspecting judge. In late October 2022, the inspectorate judge for correctional services, Justice Edwin Cameron, informed me indeed through a telephone call that he has come across information which may indicate that the offender Tawo Bester's death may be mysteriously or as previously notified might not be suicide. Justice Cameroon informed me that it appears to him this exceeds probability or credence, but it's an investigation that is underway uh, from themselves as chicks, but there is also investigation by both uh, the South African Police Service and the Department of Correctional Services. This left me and induced me with shock, Chairperson. Uh, uh, Disbelief, incredibility, and uh, I sat down after he, I spoke to him because our, he left me confused that can such a thing really happen uh, in our country. But after I have recollected myself, I immediately called the National Commissioner for Correctional Services to inform him about my telephonic discussion with the inspecting judge. What he informed me, and that this is very important and urgent, that the National Commissioner must prioritize this matter of uh, this suspected escape. Because if indeed it's true, this is going to be one of the most uh, um, biggest undermination of the criminal justice system. In response, the National Commissioner informed me that indeed he is aware that there is an ongoing investigation in the department and that he could not inform me at that stage because the investigations was at a very preliminary stage. Uh, at the department, he was awaiting some concrete information to take it further with myself. And I will from time to time inquire uh, with the National Commissioner on the progress on this investigation, to which he responded that he is awaiting the final report and all the processes. And again, I said to him, this is very important and urgent. But I also asked him, but if indeed this guy is, is true that they, they is not him and so forth, he said, no, there is, a, there is complications. So I asked, what are these complications? 
He said, no. The first one is that G4S is insisting that the person who died on that day is turbo -based. So I said, okay, that's one I get it. But the judge, I mean, if the judge is raising this thing, I suspect that there's something. And then he said, no, the second complication is that there is an ongoing police investigation by SAPS, which they have informed him that we must not do anything that might jeopardize the investigation. So I said, but uh, what are those things they're do, dealing with? Because, I mean, if we're dealing with a straightforward escape, I don't see what is the complication. They can just go arrest this person that is suspected to be this guy and uh, test this person. Then he says, no, the problem is that they have informed him that this is broader than just an escape. There's multiple bodies. There's a suspension of a scheme. There's a huge network that is being investigated that might be alerted with any uh, process that might jeopardize the investigation. I then said to the National Commissioner, then that's fine, uh, but let's find a way to prioritize, check the matter and follow it up. I also want to deal with the issue that the, uh, the inspecting judge raised uh, earlier, that from the, when I realized, uh, Chairperson, that uh, from the timelines that the inspecting judge submitted here, a report that he sent me a letter on the 26th of October, 2022, um, I asked my office because I had never seen the letter. What I still remembered is the telephone discussion. I checked with my office if we did receive this email, and they indicated that we do not receive the email and the letter and I've requested them to provide proof to the committee uh, to that effect, which shows that it did not uh, come through to the, to the chief of staff. But still, that does not mean that I was not informed by the judge. The judge informed me. The content of the letter I confirm is what he informed me in the telephone conversation. And I dealt with that matter in that, uh, in that context. I received the final investigation report from DCS on the 24th of March, 2023, and we then convened a meeting with the DM immediately to, after receiving this report, and also when we were uh, also pricked by the public uh, um, in terms of the media issues and so forth to say, we have been pushing since that period to say, let's get this, uh, this report which we finally got on the 24th of March, 2023. And the questions were asked, and I think as DCS present, it will become apparent what we dealt with. We, as Chick said, we will get the final report uh, from, from Chicks. I also want the uh, chairperson to say that there could be other details of the identity of uh, the gentleman and so forth and passports. We will endeavor to explain from our side. We know him as Tabo Pesta. But some of the things I think Home Affairs, they said they will hold a press briefing to explain exactly how it works that someone can be a South African and, and still not have an ID document or something like that. So I will request Chairperson with your indulgence that they will allow the National Commissioner to go into the details of the, of the presentation. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, National Commissioner. Thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members of the Committee, um, the Inspecting Judge, uh, CEO of, uh, of JICS, um, colleagues that are in the, in the meeting, and everybody else, good afternoon. Um, Honorable Chairperson, I'm going to request that uh, we go straight into the presentation of the department. The um, inspecting judge did indicate that uh, our investigation report is 40 pages. Um, I would like to, to indicate to the committee that uh, this investigation report is supported by um, an extras in the form of um, evidence 
that supports every statement we make in the report. The whole report with the annexures actually um, is, is more than 336 pages. Um, I'm mentioning that because we had to support each and every statement we make with either affidavits or information that we could uh, gather as we continued with the investigation. And uh, the annexures um, as evidence are available immediately uh, to the committee. I'm going to request Honorable Chairperson that uh, we um, present the report through Director Killian, who's a director responsible for the Departmental uh, Investigation Unit. He, he will be assisted by uh, the acting Deputy Commissioner in the Office of the National uh, Commissioner, Dr. Zota Musoma. I'm also with a team uh, from the department. As we continue to engage, we will then introduce members of the team. As, um, but also on that, Honorable Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members, I'll be guided in terms of, because we actually have a team here. Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I suspect the other members of the team would be answering questions, but not everybody will be presenting. Yes, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Um, Director, I think the Minister and the National Commissioner have already greeted us on your behalf, so let's just go straight to the presentation. Thank you, Chairperson, Honorable Members. Um, I'm going to start right away, I should request. The purpose of this presentation today is to provide a Portfolio Committee on Justice Correction Services with a summary of a security-rated incident on 3 May 2022 regarding offender Tabo Besta, who was detained at Mangaung Correctional Center, a private-public partnership in the Free State Northern Cape region. Um, I'm not going to go to the overview of the, some of the pages in the presentation. I'm, I'll ask Dr. Matsuma just to go to slide six because the minister already alluded to that in his, in his opening. That will be a repetition. Slide six, uh, background to Mangaung Correctional Center. In terms of the written agreement concluded between the Department of Correctional Services and Bluefontaine Contracts, um, or BCC as they are commonly known, on 24 March 2000, in the concession agreement, um, Bluefontaine Correctional Contracts operates the Mangaung Correctional Center, MCC, as a public-private partnership under the sections 103 to 112 of the Correctional Services Act as amended. The contract is shareholding equity and the right confirms the following shareholding. G4S Care and Justice Limited is 20%, Old Mutual 20%, Fikile Mangaun is 20%, Equisi, I hope I pronounced that correct, Community Trust is 20% and 10 Alliance Mangaun is 20%. In terms of Section 107 of the Correctional Services Act, the contractor appoints a director with the prior approval of the National Commissioner as the head of the, of the center. The subcontractors and the functioned Mangaung Correctional Center are the following. G4S is responsible for custodial services, KKS uh, for food services, Farani Health uh, Healthcare Solutions, and Integron Integrate Solution Maintenance, who already appeared before the Commission. In terms of Mangaung Correctional Center became operational on 1 July 2001 with a bed capacity of 2,928. And as we've heard, the contract will end on 30 June 2026 with a, capa a staff capacity of 507. I need to mention that there is currently litigation pending, uh, civil litigation to recover an amount of 110 million for invoking section 112 during 2013. And that matter is, is, is uh, pending before court as we speak. I'm going to skip nine. Mangaung and Katuma Sutamule became operational on 1 July and 16 February 2002 with bed capacities, as we already said, of 3,024 and 2,298 respectively. Contracts will end on 30, uh, June 2026 and 15 February. The National Commission appointed two operational takeover teams in November 2021, led by the regional commissions of Free State Northern Cape and LNM and these regional commissioners are resp is responsible for those two specific regions where these centers are situated. The teams will be under the management of the DCS Management Committee consisting of all chief deputy commissioners. 
the task team development work stream for each of the disciplines in the takeover process. It is envisaged that DCS will work with the current contractors for the last 12 months of the contract period to ensure a smooth takeover when the contract ends. If we look at the uh, inmate offence categories uh, of the inmates that's currently in, in uh, Mongong, um, aggressive, murder, assault and robbery, total of 3,200. Sexual, which is rape, attempted rape and indecent assault is 1,900. Theft, 86. Drugs is 18. And economic, 592. And then there's other various crimes of 1,036. Um, just to mention that some of the inmates have committed more Sorry, than Sorry, Director. Uh, I'm not sure um, because we received this document some time back. Uh, last week uh, already. We have gone through the document. Um, I think you can jump some of these slides and go to the most pertinent issues. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chairperson. I'll go to the findings on the incidents then. Thank you. I'll start with the, the incident where Tabu Besta is then involved. An inmate by the name of Tabu Besta was reported by G4S to the DCS controller to have committed suicide by means of setting his cell alight on 3rd of May 2022. As per the standing operating procedures, an investigation was initiated, and on the road, the investigation started, challenges were experienced in terms of accessing relevant information and persons of interest. Uh, G4S officials were removed from the facility due to dismissals and suspensions. And we'll, we'll elaborate a little bit more of that in further slides. In addition to the, the DCS, other institutions such as SAPS and, and JICS were also conducting their own investigations. Tawo Besta was charged and found guilty of uh, rape two counts, robbery of aggravating circumstances four counts, indecent assault and murder. And we need to mention that these offenses were committed whilst he was on parole at the time uh, for a sentence uh, for fraud. Uh, he was sentenced to life plus 75 years imprisonment, and was also serving 285 and 335 days for parole break. On 24 October 2013, uh, the offender was transferred from a DCS facility to the Mongolian Correctional Centre, uh, public-private partner facility in the Free State of Northern Cape. When the Bester was graded A+, plus at the time of his escape, now maybe just to explain, in relation to the A+, plus, it must be mentioned that Mongolian uh, Correctional Centre uses a system where the offender starts at the highest group and is then downgraded with negative behavior. The philosophy is that the offender will continue with good behavior in order not to lose his privileges. In the other correctional sentences in DCS, uh, use a system where the offender starts on a lower group level and must earn a higher level with consistent good behavior. So just the opposite to that. Once DCS takes over the center, the DCS privilege system will be implemented to be consistent with other correctional centers. Uh, sequence of events. Maybe before I start with the first bullet there, um, th there was a point raised that on the 30th of April, the application for segregation, um, that it was not sent to the inspecting judge. Now, what we need to indicate here is that there was an application, we have the application form, but that application form was never approved by the controller, and it was also never provided to the controller. In fact, there's a date stamp of, the, of G4S on this form of the 3rd of May 2022, and it forms part of our internal uh, investigation. So maybe just to correct that, so it would then not have re been reported to the inspecting judge because it was never approved by the, by the controller. On the 3rd of May 2022, the subcontractor G4S reported to the DCS controller that an inmate by the name of Tabu Besta committed suicide by setting his cell alight. The SAPS attended to the alleged suicide scene opened an inquest at Bloomsbury uh, CAS 26 of 5, 2022, and the burned body was taken by subs. On the 4th of May, 2022, the post-mortem was conducted, and the findings were that a person who was found in the cell died from blunt force to the head, did not have smoke inhalation lungs, and showed early signs of decomposition, and we've heard that from subs as well. 
the, the SAPS informed G4S that they changed the inquest to a homicide, and G4S informed the DCS controller on 6 June of this. The letter from G4S, however, indicates the death of inmate Tabu Bester was now a homicide, meaning that they still considered the body as that of Tabu Bester. G4S proceeded to conduct their own investigation. Uh, the outcome of this investigation was, however, never provided to DCS until 31 March, despite formal requests to obtain it. As per the contract and standing operating procedures, it is expected that the controller becomes aware of any purported breach of contract by the contractor. Um, the, con the controller shall procure the diligent investigation of such purported breach. The controller therefore appointed two officials, Mr. MP Sattlai, head of Grootvlei Medium B, Ms. my apologies, uh, head of uh, Grootvlei Medium B Correctional Centre, and Mr. MP Mosweshwe, they, they are actually here, sitting in the Grand Commissioner, senior professional nurse from Weapon Correctional Centre, to assist him and his deputy to investigate the incident. Uh, on 28 October, maybe I must just pause here, um, on the document that was provided to the members, uh, Chairperson, it was says 18 October, and it's also shown on the slide, but it's actually the 28th of October, that's a typing error. 28th of October, the controllers had a meeting with SAPS and JIGS, and a copy of the post-mortem and DNA results were received from, from the SAPS, uh, actually from, from, the, from JIGS. The, the investigators signed a draft investigation report on 18 November 2022, and the controller signed the draft investigation report on 22 November 22. The draft report was submitted by hand on 25 November to the Director of Contract Management for finalization and submission to the National Commissioner. The National Commissioner received a copy of this draft investigation report on the same day, that is 25 November, from the region and requested the acting DC Executive Management in his office to make a follow with the region if a criminal case was opened. Um, as subs referred to. On 12 January, the controller opened a case, and I hear SAPS says it's the 14th, um, so there's a little bit of a dispute about the date there. The controller opened a case of escape with SAPS Bloomsbreit, and case number 316 of January 2023 was received on 16 January. The region then indicated uh, that the subs refused to open a case in prior engagements with them, and I think they referred to that. The National Commissioner made inquiries with Director of Contract Management in, in the National Head Office, uh, who is responsible for the two private prisons, on several occasions between November 2022 and March 23, to which she replied that she's still engaging with the additional information that was received. In the week of 13 March 2023, the National Commissioner directed that a final investigation report to be delivered by his office by the 22nd of March 2023. Um, that report was delivered as directed, signed by the Director Contract Management on 22 March 2023. If we go to the investigation process and the findings of that investigation, um, it's quite elaborate. The sequence of events outlined in, invest in the report substantiates that there were a number of breaches of the contract leading up to the escape of Tabo Besta. The contractor allowed a private vehicle to enter the center via the sally port without a gate pass, and the driver was the security supervisor, and these actions constitute a breach of security. The contractor segregated offender Tabu Besta for own safety to Broadway unit without approval of the CSC in terms of the contract. The contractor misled the Department of Correctional Services by reporting an unnatural death of offender Tabu Besta instead of an aided, aided escape. Number four, the contractor failed to ensure supervision in Broadway unit where the incident occurred. The contractor failed to perform general supervision specifically at cell 35 after the report of smoke from Broadway unit. The contractor failed to provide CSC, the, 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 the controller, with video recordings of the Broadway unit which indicates a failure to, to house block security as all activities were not monitored. The contractor submitted false records with regard to defects on the security system, and yet there was a malfunction of the system in Broadway unit, Atman building, and Sally Port. The contractor failed to ensure effective patrolling around the center between 1900 um, and 7, 730, that's 1900 in the evening and 730 the following morning on the 2nd of May. The contractor contravened the contract by bringing an authorized article, that is the petrol, the salarant, 
including then a corpse into the facility. The contractor breached the contract by assisting offender Tabo Bester to escape from Monga Home Correctional Center through all these breaches. The contractor intelligence system failed to gather, analyze, and disseminate information, hence no alert of an escape which was planned by G4S officials. Contractor failed to monitor perimeter security, which led to an aided escape. Failed to monitor the prison on 24 hours basis, which led to aided escape. Contractor failed to monitor CCTV and alarm security system, which failed to alert the incident of escape. The security intelligence system of the contractor is not effective in gathering intelligence security information by not picking up the major incident of planned escape uh, through all systems in place, which resulted to aided escape without their knowledge. Contractor failed to keep the offender in custody as it allowed the escape to happen, and operational procedures were not followed and thus compromised security of the prison. Contractor failed to secure safe custody and rehabilitation of offenders, and that's your view that a contact by the contractor has damaged the relationship between the two parties. The, if I refer to the post-mortem and DNA results, and maybe just to say that this was also elaborated on by the SAPS already. Um, so maybe I'm going to go to the next one. The recommendations on the investigation report. The investigation report mentioned that penalties must be issued to the contractor for the breaches as listed and the, the findings. And this issuing of penalties will be handled as provided for in the concession contract, which is quite an elaborate process. Steps taken after receiving the final report. After considering the investigation report, the National Commission called for a meeting with various people um, in the office, which will take place in the office of the regional commissioner. The purpose of this meeting was to receive a brief on the investigation report commissioned by the controller. This meeting took place 23rd March 2023 in the office of the regional commissioner uh, Bloemfontein Free State in Northern Cape. Um, there are a few inquiries and follow-ups made by JICS to DCS and the Ministry regarding the investigation of offender Tabo Bester. However, at that stage, the investigation was not yet finalized. Therefore, there is no information that could have been provided. Emanating out of the brief, the National Commissioner addressed a letter to the controller to obtain further information which will assist to validate the findings and recommendations, in particular the assertion that the offender was aided in his escape from custody. Out of the factual findings of the investigation report and information available and presented during this brief to the National Commissioner um, by the investigators, it was concluded that inmate Tabu Bester escaped from Mangaung Correctional Center on the 3rd of May 2022. It was only reported to the National Commissioner in the briefing meeting on the 23rd March that a controller opened a criminal case on 12 January and the case number was received from SAPS, as I already said. Uh, the SAPS is still investigating escape and the events surrounding the escape, as we've heard from them. Activation of the track and trace team. Early hours of the morning of the 24th of March this year, the National Commissioner activated the DCS team to work in collaboration with SAPS to track, trace, and re-arrest the offender. Track and trace team compromised of the following officials, DCS, SAPS, Department of Home Affairs, and the Assist forfeiture unit. Um, and this team provides regular feedback to the SAPS. So DS was, DCS was throughout involved with this track and trace. Legal remedies in terms of Section 112 of the Correctional Services Act. Section 112 of the Correctional Services Act states the following, in the f if in the opinion of the Commissioner, in consultation with the Minister, the Director has lost or is likely to lose effective control of a public-private partnership, sent or any part of it, it is necessary in the interest of safety and security to take control of such public-private partnership correctional center or part of it. He or she may appoint a temporary manager to act as the head of that correctional center and may replace custody officials with correctional officials to the extent necessary. The appointment B, appointment referred to in paragraph A starts at the time specified in the temporary manager's written letter of appointment and ends on written notice to that effect. During the appointment of appointment referred to in paragraph B, the temporary manager performs the functions of the director and the contractor and any subcontractor must do all that is possible to facilitate the performance by the temporary manager of those functions. As soon as practical, after making or terminating the appointment of a temporary manager, the national commissioner must give notice of such action to the contractor, the director, and the controller. 24 March, the national commissioner directed the departmental investiga investigation unit to investigate the role and conduct of DCS officials. And this investigation process is
currently in process. On 29 March 2023, the National Commission has suspended the director contract management. 30 March, the National Commission has contemplated the controller and deputy controller to suspend them. Uh, Ms. Gladys Rantente is appointed as the DCS controller for Mangaung. She's currently there. I think she's here today. The Department of Correctional Services has referred the concession contract and the related documents for legal advice, exploring other remedies available to the Department of Correctional Services. Um, after carefully considering the findings and recommendations of the investigation report on the Tabo Best Escape incident, and consulting the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Mr. Lamola, the National Commissioner decided to invoke Section 112 of the Correctional Services Act, rate with Clause 55 of the concession contract. Findings of the investigation report pointed to the fact that the director of the Mangaung Correctional Center has lost effective control of the facility, amongst other factors, and the Correctional Services Act does provide for a mechanism to restore safety and security by taking control of the Correctional Center by means of appointing a temporary manager, as we've done. Temporary manager will perform the functions of the director. Mr. Patrick Ali Mashabataha was appointed as temporary manager of Mangaung Correctional Center uh, with immediate effect. Uh, the Section 112 process will be reviewed in six months. Contractor has been duly informed of this decision, and Mr. Mashabataha will be supported by other officials that have been appointed in order to ensure that a Mangaung Correctional facility is able to render the required services without experiencing shortcomings. To support the temporary manager, the region has identified the following support staff. The area commission of Grootvlei will provide support. Uh, assistant director, one senior correctional officer and a and the security officer, and the emergency support room from Grootvlei will be made available when needed. In terms of an action plan, a physical roll call of inmates with fingerprints identification uh, to take place from 31 March to 6 April, and we can confirm that ra that roll call was completed with fingerprints of all those inmates taken and that all the inmates that are supposed to be there are then accounted for. The reinstatement of inmates' disciplinary hearings, and that will be a continuous process. The reclassification transfer of inmates qualifying to be medium, continuous process. Controlled movement of inmates from one unit to the other, continuous. Enhancement of handling of complaints and requests, continuous. And analysis of incidents for the past five years. Um, that's a target date from the 3rd of, um, to the 14th of April, should be 31 March. Proper mending of access control gates, that's a continuous process. Confirmation of vetting of custodial officials, uh, those dates are still to be determined. Uh, lifestyle audits of custodial officials of G4S, uh, that process still needs to be arranged. A review of structured day programs, uh, which should happen with immediate effect, they're already busy with that. Implementation of monthly security committee meetings uh, from the 1st of May. A reassessment of the surveillance camera system as well as the position of such um, to establish implementation of a uh, backup system and to extend the period seven, uh, seven day data storage. Um, and that's a continuous process. To conduct a building structural survey to determine the current state of the structure, there was actually a, such a document already available. Uh, activities taking place at night must be in the presence of the director, security, or delegated manager. Um, we would note from all the, what was said here is that the people that was on duty were able to open the cell. And normally in correctional centers, the cell is not just open. The person on standby must come out and be present when the cell is opened after hours. Um, for security reasons, identification reasons, etc. On the 31 March 2023, DCS received a letter from the legal representative of G4S demanding that DCS immediately revoke the Section 112 notice by close of business on Monday, 3rd of April, failing which they will approach the court on an urgent basis for a leave. Um, that letter was responded to that the appointment of the temporary manager remains. In terms of what was in the media environment, communication. Media entities made inquiries on the 3rd of May 2022 about Tabo Besta before the department issued an alert on the incident. It became necessary for the department to confirm what was reported by Mangaung Correctional Center affirming that Tabo Besta committing suicide by setting his cell alight. The issue remained in the media environment then for a few days and disappeared. 
was in November 22 when there was explosive media reports from ground up on Tabu Bester casting doubts about a suicide report and asking if this was not an escape. What was to follow was sustained media coverage from ground up on the same matter and it started giving details on what may have happened on the 3rd of May 2022. Media engagement, media statements and response to inquiries have been the preferred methods in managing this issue. The presentation is submitted to the committee. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, is that all? National Commissioner. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, that is all. Very much. I note the hands, Honorable. In fact, there are two requests. Let's, say, let's drop our hands. There were two requests first. It was Honorable Jelle and Honorable Breitenbach. I will start with Honorable Jelle and then Honorable Breitenbach. Then the third one, let's start. Honorable Ramulibim. Honorable Swart, okay. Honorable Swart, Honorable Engelberg, uh, Honorable Horn, Honorable. Uh, I can't tell him. Velma, new vote, Drochen. Honorable uh, Yako, Honorable Ramulu Bing. Honorable Koza and then Honorable Janji in that order. <laughs> um, do you want to stick to the last agreement or do you want to revert back to the first agreement? Fifteen, chair. Fifteen, fifteen, fifteen. So when I stick to time, Liang Bang is, yeah. I just say I am your servant. I stick to time as given by you. So Liang Bang is. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, in terms of the rules, donation do happen. Um, so the rules of the National Assembly still do apply. Um, but every report is going to be limited to 15 minutes. Honorable Swart. Mm -mm. Thank you very much, Chair. I so wish that uh, I can escape. <laughs> Honorable. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And Thank you to the minister, the, Mr. DM, and the national commissioner and the team. Uh, your presentation gave us a lot of information that we needed. And I think it's easy for us now. Honorable Chair, uh, please, uh, your voice is low. It's, it, it seems as if you want to escape more than me. <laughs> no, my apology, Chair, and, and the committee. No, my question, Chair, I was just thanking the minister and the team. My, my, my question, Chair, first, we note, Chair, that uh, the department has already taken a decision on, on this matter, and we appreciate that. And also, Chair, we note the, the, the findings by the department indeed are very serious, very serious. Uh, considering the amount that we pay monthly, Chair, that is one thing that we raised earlier, that do we get value for money? And <clears throat> Sorry, the, 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 the minister has confirmed that, Chair, that indeed uh, on the matters that those were raised by the committee, in terms of the infrastructure, we are happy. But in terms of the runnings of, of the centers, 
some of us, Chair, we are definitely, in fact, if not all of us, we are not happy, totally not happy, and we appreciate the action that has been taken uh, by the National Commit, uh, Commission and the Minister on this matter, as I said earlier. But uh, the first question that I would, I would like to ask, to question, to, 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 to pose to the National Commissioner is that uh, Mr. Matabata, what is this? Mashabataha, Mashabataha. Is, is he already now, as we are speaking, uh, on site? That is the first question, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, uh, Mr. Mashabataha was uh, installed on the 30th of March. And the team. Uh, 2023, and the team. Thank you very much. The second question is that, Chair, we are paying 45 million a month. And now Mr. Mat Matabaha is already there in the team. It means G uh, G4S have vacated the place. Does, it, does, does, does that mean we don't have the officials of G4S on site? Is the question? Thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson. In terms of Section 112, the action that um, has been uh, put in place is the replacement of the director of G4S by a temporary manager in the person of Mr. Mashaba Taha. The management of G4S is still at the center, and uh, also the staff of G4S is still at the center. What we also did was to provide Mr. Mashabataha with um, colleagues to assist him because uh, Mangaung and Khrotfle are next to each other. We put together a team of the officials that uh, are from the region to assist him. So what does that mean, mean uh, National Commissioner, is that we are, continue, we are going to continue paying them 45 million rents a month? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. In terms of the, the concession agreement, any cost that we go into in care as the department, we will claim back from G4S on this intervention. Okay. Um, another question on, on that matter, Chair. Uh, is there anything in the contract that makes us not to cancel this thing altogether at this mo uh, moment, even if you are still working on with the two structures on site. Um, okay. It's minutes I was thinking about it because my understanding is that the d department has uh, sought legal opinion in this issue. No, I'm not on that. Yeah, but, but let me first deal okay. with this one. Um, it has sought legal opinion on this issue. Uh, maybe let's uh, let us not put them on the spot um, because they've said uh, specifically on that particular issue. Thank you, Chair. But it seems as if the minister uh, would want to say something. Can you give him? Yeah, no. It was on the first question, the the, the issue of the claiming back of the money from um, G4S. To just state to, to the committee that you will remember that when we presented, we said that there's a dispute of 2013. So the dispute also emanated from us taking over. Uh, it was about 100 and, uh, 100 and something million. The commissioner can, can, can confirm the amount. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, on the issue of the escape piece, it, it seems as if this is not the, not, not even it seems as if it is now known that uh, it is not the first escape in, in that center. We have others previously, even though we are, we are given uh, low numbers, but um, there's a lot that is happening uh, that has been reported by uh, the journalist uh, dating back to 2013. Um, I just want to find out, after uh, someone, or uh, I, mean, I mean to say inmate has escaped and later that inmate is apprehended 
what is the procedure? Do you just take that uh, inmate back without maybe having some charges that are adding on top of the, the case or the, the punishment that the inmate would have uh, got before coming to the center? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. An escape is, a, is a, um, an act of criminality, so uh, that's why we open a case with SAPS. Um, that's number one. Number two, also in terms of our internal disciplinary codes that we um, uh, implement with regards to the, to the behavior of offenders, we will then uh, uh, apply that. Number three, what we do immediately after we've realized that there's an escape, we institute an investigation. Uh, the investigation will point out to um, uh, problems that we've had uh, in terms of security. It would, sometimes it points out to the role that has been played by uh, officials. Uh, it will point out to any defects in the system. So, you know, uh, implement improvements where we need to uh, uh, implement consequence management, we do that. Uh, National Commissioner, there is an allegation that uh, there were other escapes uh, recently uh, before this one of, of, of uh, Bester. And uh, the allegation is that the procedure was not followed. Do you know anything about that? That procedure of that inmate that you normally do was not followed. There was an escape um, in December. Um, the department knows about that. I know about that. The escape was reported by, by G4S uh, to the department through the controller. There was an investigation that was conducted uh, by G4S. The controller also conducted uh, an investigation. We have received a, a, an executive preliminary report. Um, we have asked questions about that investigation. Well, part of the tasks uh, of the, the team led by Mr. Mashabataha is to look at that investigation. We have received also um, uh, anonymous uh, in, uh, letters. We've also received complaints from uh, uh, inmates about how that escape was treated and the role of some of the uh, officials from G4S. And part of the investigation that uh, Mr. Killian from the Departmental Investigation Unit uh, is working on is the same uh, uh, escape. Now we've got the issue of Bester. How long is that going to take, uh, the, the, the investigation for the, the, the one that you've just spoken about? How long is it going to take for it to be resolved? Because I don't know what, what investigations needed to be done because this person escaped and then came back and that person just would just have to add the, the charges. Maybe it's, it's because I don't know the procedure, hence I said that. And the, what happened to the manager, responsible operation manager, because there is somebody who's responsible for that. Did we get the report that uh, tells us exactly what happened by the manager? The ones, some of them are those names that I, call, I, I, I mentioned yesterday, uh, was it yesterday? Uh, the, the, there's Olga, somebody by the name of Olga, if I'm not mistaken, and the other one is for security, which is Ida, but the other one, you'll, you'll remember, they will remember, they will remind us if they still remember those names. But I know there's this lady who is an operational manager. That is, I think, is supposed to be giving us that report. Do you have the report of that operational manager in terms of this case? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. We have a report, as I have indicated, of the work that was done on G4S on this matter. And I've indicated that uh, since we, uh, since Mr. Mashabataka started working from the 30th of March, we gave an instruction that he must start the investigation from scratch because we've got questions about that. But over and above that, um, the director uh, investigation unit in the department is investigating the role of the controller, the deputy controller, 
and any other staff of the department that was, in for, or that was involved before we took over on the 30th of March. <laughs> now, in terms of how long will that investigation uh, take, I would not necessarily give the exact time, but what I would say is that um, we are the ones now as DCS that are managing the institution from the, the point of view and the authority of the temporary manager. Now, that will give us access to all the information we need faster uh, and better than uh, before when we're dealing with the issue of uh, uh, Was the matter reported to Jigs? Yes, the matter was reported to Jigs in terms of the procedures. Thank you. Can we go to page? Five minutes. Yes, page six, I'm, I'm done, Che. On page six, Che, uh, the, the inmate population, population in Mangaou, Che, there's, a, there's something strange down there. It says, Unidentified, uh, what in, inmate, and there are about hundred. What do you mean by that? And also, is 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 Besta one of them? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I'm going to ask a, a thing, a, a DC, a Dr. Musoma, to answer that question. I may come in. After that, if there is a need, through you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you, National Commissioner, and thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the slide on inmate population in Mangaung Correctional Center, as you would uh, see in this uh, table, is actually indicating uh, the, the, the origin of those uh, inmates per province. You will also notice that uh, just on row number three from the bottom that we have also indicated the number of the foreign nationals that are there. But now, as you will know that uh, Mangawung is fed from different correctional centers within DCS. So in the process of then uh, uh, transferring the offenders and also providing the files, the hundred was not yet analyzed in terms of the, where they are coming from in terms of the province. But now, for the sake of making sure that our statistics balances, we had to specify there in that row that those when unidentified in terms of the province were 100. Thank you, Chairperson. In terms of the pro, uh, provinces, but now in terms of saying Besta did not have an ID, uh, ID where is he identified there? The number he didn't have an ID, but it's coming from Gauteng, ne? Gauteng, I don't know where he's coming from anyway, because he's all over. He's even now coming from Tanzania. Maybe he was trying to get to where he's coming from. I don't know. I'm just, because he doesn't have an ID. And uh, yes, the police told us that uh, they identified the relatives, but he doesn't have an ID. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. It is true, uh, Honorable Members, that uh, most of our inmate population, in actual fact, this is a deliberate act at times. They don't want to produce their IDs or to present them, mainly because they are running away from other charges or other criminal activities that they have committed. That's why they keep on changing their names. So in terms of disaggregating this data per province, it was uh, basically an exercise to show where most of our inmates per province are from on that uh, target group. Thank you, Chairperson. Last one, Chair. Uh, it, it, is, it is about uh, page seven, the numbers, Chair, of the sexual inmate offenses on, the category, on that category. I see the chair uh, the, on the sexual category. It says 1,000, meaning it's number two. I think this is the issue that the president at some point mentioned, that it is very serious. But now I want to know, having uh, this number or these numbers, particularly these offenses has, has been done, has been uh, committed against women. And we have uh, such uh, centers that allow escapes of such people. 
And uh, I know the category, the, I don't even want to, to talk about. In fact, those people that I'm talking about, the sexual, they also fall on that category if we have to identify BESTA. So BESTA is one of the most dangerous uh, 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 um, inmates. So I want to know, if we keep on getting these escapes, National Commissioner. Please round up. Yes. I'm, a, I'm the chair. If we keep on getting these escapes, are we continually saying these perpetrators must go back and do these things to women? Are you really not worried and come with mechanisms in terms of tightening your, sec your security in order to make us protected, uh, uh, protected as women? Because where we are, Chair, I'm scared myself because I don't know if maybe we'll be able to hold best uh, from all this, the information that we got. Thank you, Chair. Can you comment, uh, National Commissioner? Members, please note, if your time has expired, you won't get a response. Because I warn you five minutes before, I warn you to round up. So if your time expires, you won't get a response. Honorable Pritenbach. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the Minister of Justice because I see that he's uh, becoming uncomfortable sitting there for the whole day and I'm scared he falls asleep. So I'm going to uh, make an effort to wake him up a little. So, uh, Minister, you're the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services. It's a big job, very big portfolio. It doesn't matter that you have two deputies, each one helping on a different thing. You're responsible overarchingly for justice and correctional services in this country. Do you agree? Yeah. And it's your job, Minister, to ensure the safety of South African citizens. It's your job in, as the uh, Minister of Justice and Correctional Services in conjunction with the rest of the criminal justice cluster to ensure the safety of South African citizens. Make sure that they're safe in their homes every night. Is that correct? Yeah. And then I presume that you'll agree with me that in this particular instance you have failed. Yes, that's why we apologize to the nation. Good. Um, you because we, we don't, uh, we take responsibility in terms of the act, the overall responsibility as the custodian of um, prisons in this country is the Department of Correctional Services. Mm. Yes. Well, to your credit then, you uh, take responsibility and it's admirable quality. But you're a lawyer yourself. You're, you, you've been a practicing attorney. You understand about culpability and you understand about culpability of the state. And you understand about your failure to protect both the public at large and more importantly the victims of this particular offender. And when you knew, let's say at the best for you, when you knew in October of 2022, that best had escaped, or that it was very likely that it escaped. What steps did you take, you, to ensure that the victims of, of uh, BESTA were informed, adequately supported, adequately protected? What steps did you take? Yeah, Honorable Brandenburg, as I've said, um, after the telephone call with the, with the inspecting judge, I immediately called the National Commissioner to... Eh? Yeah, yeah, because I was shocked to the call, and I did mention it to, to the judge that uh, this is uh, something, yeah, something else. But yeah, I will definitely engage the National Commissioner, which I did, to prioritize this matter and to deal with the issues of the investigations as urgently as possible. And that's where he told me that already 
there is an investigation that is ongoing, which I asked why I was not aware of this thing. He says, no, it's because they did not have enough information to bring. They were still at the preliminary stages of the investigation, the, the investigators. So, Minister, forgive me, but that's just not good enough. You phone up the commissioner, he tells you that there is an investigation. They haven't bothered to inform you uh, because they don't have enough information. The information that they have is that there was a dead body in a cell in Bloemfontein that doesn't belong to Tabo Bester. And Tabo Bester is no longer in that prison. He's a serial rapist, he's a murderer, he's convicted. He has victims out there. My question to you was, what steps did you take, you, to inform his victims, to protect his victims, to support his victims? Yeah, Honorable Bredenbach, it's not correct. In terms of the timelines, at the time when I spoke to the National Commission, he told me that the investigation is still at the preliminary stage. And the preliminary stage, when I asked, what do you mean, what is it that you have? I mean, he said, no, we still need to get the various reports that relates to confirming whether indeed this guy has escaped. Because one, um, G4S is still insisting that the body that died there is the one of, or that they found, <laughs> is the one of, uh, <laughs> of <laughs> yeah, the person who died there is, the, is this Mr. Tabopest. So at that, that at the time, that is what was happening. And secondly, as you will be aware, Honorable uh, Bradenberg, it then becomes the responsibility of the corrections unit in the departments to inform uh, the victims and deal with them because, I mean, it's all over the country. And I did uh, engage the national commissioner. I think the national commissioner can take it from there because I, my responsibility deals with oversight and also to check whether what should be done is indeed done. I differ from you, Minister. I think your responsibility uh, entails everything. It's a big job. You've accepted that responsibility, and you can't pass the buck, which is what you're trying to it do. It is not in terms of the Correctional Services Act. Uh, I'm, not the I'm not talking the, about the I'm not talking about the Act. The, 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 the responsibility, and Sorry, you will Minister. always... No. Sorry, Minister. No. I think let's give each other space uh, to, we, we can't uh, talk oh, past each other. My apology. I'm not talking about the act, uh, Minister, and you know it. I'm talking about your responsibility as a lawyer, as a human being, as a Minister of Justice. Don't tell me that that is circumscribed by the act. That, that's, a, that's a poor show, it's an indictment on you. And I honestly thought you were better than that. You have a deputy sitting next to you. Did you phone him up and say, this thing has happened? Do you know about it? What are you doing about it? And will you please sort out the victims, some sort of initiative to protect them, to support them? Did you do that? Honorable Bredenbach, you are the proponent of saying we need to give professionals the independence to do their job. While we follow up, while we look at them, while they give us reports, but you cannot also be the one who also becomes the National Commissioner, the Accounting Authority, and the Accounting Officer. With regards to the Deputy Minister, as I've said, that when I got this thing, the first call I made was to the National uh, Commissioner, for example. And at that time, I did not even inform my staff, for example, um, that I had this discussion with the inspecting judge, and this is his view, uh, that there could be this thing. Because I thought that this is very sensitive. I must limit it as far as possible. And the National Commissioner, when he has got preliminary information and reports, he will be able to inform the Deputy Minister. So, Minister, I would ask you to keep your answers a little shorter than that because you're taking up my 15 minutes. Uh, all I can say to you is that, in my view, you fell short of the mark. My other questions are to uh, DCS. Uh, I can just say to you, Minister, that being shocked seems to sort of run in your, the cabinet circles. The president's always shocked that we don't have electricity. You shocked. You were shocked that the Guptas weren't extradited. Shock seems to be a, a thing 
uh, maybe consult someone about that. I suspect you're also shocked, Honorable President. You know, unfortunately, this, uh, unfortunately, shocked I'm not. Everyone. No, unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, members, please, please. Uh, my next question is to DCS. Um, when you were informed of this occurrence at uh, Mangahung, uh, at what time did the first DCS person arrive at that scene? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I'm going to ask one of the investigators to answer that question. Thank you, <coughs> Honorable Chairperson. Um, the incident happened around uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, according to the Chief OS officials, they immediately phoned the, uh, the controller, and because controller is not far from uh, Mangaung, it took them uh, around 15 minutes, and they were already there. It was around uh, half past four in the morning. First DCS person arrived there at 4.30 in the morning. Who was that person? It was uh, the controller and the deputy controller. And they're not here today? Yes, they are not here, uh, honorable member. Okay. And did they give you a report of what they found there? What was the state of the cell? They did the, give the, the statements to the investigators. What was the state of the cell? The investigator uh, will proceed to give the details. Okay, but please a concise answer. Breidenbach, you are left with four minutes. I, I will credit you with one minute, for then I left with five minutes. Thank you. What was the state of the cell? But please be concise. Thank you, Honorable Chair. When they arrived at the scene, they, they found a lot of smoke in that, in that cell and they found a body lying down in that cell, facing down. That's what they told us uh, on our... Did they take photographs? No, they did, did not. Did anyone take photographs? Uh, only SAPS forensic did take the photographs. When did they take those photographs? on the day of the incident. When on the day of the incident? Early morning, late afternoon, middle of the night? Uh, around s past six, six o'clock when they arrive at the scene. In the morning? In the morning of the incident. And those photographs should be available? That's correct. Have you seen them? We have seen them uh, last, last, last week, one hour. What was the state of the cell? Was it damaged? Was there extensive fire damage in the cell? At the time, if I recall well, uh, the cell was like repaired, cleaned. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner? I just wanted to assist. Uh, I think the investigator is answering a question about the state of the cell that he was exposed to last week. He's not answering the question on what was the state of the cell when the body was still there in the morning of the, uh, yeah, in the morning of the incident, which is the 3rd of May, 2022. And uh, yeah, he's indicating that he, he only got access to the photos last week. And that is as a result of the takeover we did. This is the information that we could not get access to when they were doing the investigation. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, National Commissioner. Honorable Swart. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Commissioner. Uh, Minister Grandup sent you a very urgent um, response on the request for response on the 17th of March. Um, and obviously, you don't receive all the emails, but on the 17th of March, questions um, relating to the whole incident, 
um, following the exposés, and your spokesperson, Crispin P, responded that he did not see an urgency in responding, given that they, asked, they gave a, a three-hour deadline, which is very short. But the editor then, Mr. Geffen, responded to him, explaining the matter is urgent, and Peary responded that the report was not yet complete and he could not comment. Are you aware of that email? Was it brought to your attention? That's the 17th of March this year. No, I'm not, but what I'm aware of is that there was a, the spokesperson did inform me that there is a media query on the matter and uh, that uh, they want uh, our response uh, immediately at, uh, at that time. So that's what I'm aware of. But in terms of the content of the email... Uh, I understand. Uh, um, uh, Minister, but was, was your media department monitoring all the uh, media around this issue that had been building up, starting with November, which was the explosive report from ground up, to building up towards this, and obviously um, it required a response from your office or, or not? Yes, I think they were, because from time to time they will raise the issue with me, and I will always raise it to the National Commissioner to see these questions are perpetually coming. But anyway, remember, the inspecting judge has raised this issue. So we need to take it very serious because it has been raised by the inspecting judge. What, what is happening with the investigations and so forth? So that is it's, it's, it's some of those questions where the National Commissioner ended up telling me of the feedback he got from SAPS that uh, they are at the sensitive stages of the investigation and um, we must not do anything that could jeopardize the investigations and the issues of multiple bodies and various permutations that they are dealing with. Thank you, Minister. So, let's, uh, Commissioner, let's then, the responses to media, there's a brief mention about that, but it omits more than it says. And I'd like to take you to the ENCA interview with your spokesperson, um, Mr. Nku Mala, did I get it right? <laughs> but he said, he said, we stand by our statement, and I don't understand whether there was a statement, but we stand by a statement of 3 May, now that might be incorrect, 3 May, could it be another date? I'm not sure, but we stand by a statement of 3 May 2022. As you are seated now, that is now on the 18th of March, Correctional Services doesn't have the outcome of the police report, now I understand you might not have that then, but he says he doesn't have the autopsy report. Now that's a blatant lie, because by that stage, according to the JIX, on the 10th of August, JIX says SAPS gave the report to it and the DCS. On the 28th of October, on your own report, now that you've just presented to us, the copy of the post-mortem and the DNA response was received from the police. On the 16th of January, a case is opened of an escape, and a, day, a week before this, Jix advises DCS that the inmate Besta is alive, well, and dangerous. Can you explain why your spokesperson would lie on national TV to say that the department does not have the autopsy report on the 18th of March, 2023? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The communications um, section of the department receives <laughs> receives um, the final report of the of the investigations, any investigations that we conduct, and on the basis of that, they then uh, answer to media queries or make statements. Um, the report that the spokesperson was referring to is, a, is an executive report that we received officially as reported through G4S of a natural death. At that stage, when he was answering uh, that media query, he did not have in his possession a final concluded report of the investigation from the department. 
Okay, Commissioner, I'll give you that latitude that it's a final report, but the, the point that we've been trying to make, and this is where we as public representatives feel the outrage about the lack of communication with the public, and I've raised this issue ad nauseum about the policies of warning the victims. Here we have a person, the evidence is suggesting as way back, even from the previous June, uh, way back even from May last year when a police investigator says there's suspicions around this whole incident. And I think that is our concern, and that is our outrage, and that's the public's concern, that at no stage were the public advised, and I appreciate on the one hand, as Minister Chele uh, advised, that you don't want to warn him, but I think in this case, the public interest outweighs the interest of trying to trace that person then, to warn the public that here is a dangerous person, a convicted murderer, a convicted rapist, who is out, firstly at least, to warn the victims. Now, Minister, uh, this is not addressed to you, but if I heard you correctly, you said there is a policy or something, and please, I don't want to quote you incorrectly, but Commissioner, how do you warn the rape victims. Do, do you warn rape victims in a situation like this where there is an escape? You do warn them when there's a parole coming up, I understand that, but in a situation like this, is there a policy and was it done? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. In terms of the, the procedure, when there is an escape, which means that when we have conclusive evidence and information that we have an escape, we do warn members of the public. In this instance, there was a case of unnatural death that was reported, or a, we received a report on, uh, on unnatural death. At that stage, we had not received a final report that would make us conclude that we have an escape. After receiving that report, it didn't take us more than three days to issue out a statement to warn the public and we were the first uh, uh, government institution to do that because at that stage we had received a final report, we had uh, interacted with the investigators, we had checked the, the evidence in the report and conclusively at that point we went out to the public to say we have an escape. And I must also indicate that actually at that point it was still risky for the department and the national commissioner to do that because G4S still maintained that the body that bent on, on, on that, on that uh, uh, morning was the body of Tabo Bester. Sorry, National Commissioner, uh, what date was that that you issued that warning? <coughs> a roundabout, roundabout. I don't have to have a... Um, we received the report on the, on the 22nd of, of March, okay, 2023. So I understand that. So yes. that is following the massive media coverage of ground up, following your report to the police on the 16th of January of an escape. You reported to the police. So from January, at best, and in October already you've got these reports, but from January you re your officers report an escape and you wait until March to issue a warning. Now I find that unacceptable given the issues around this whole case. But I'll leave it at that. What I do want to ask you is the glaring omission is that on the 24th of March, only on the 24th of March, DCS activates the DCT team to track him down. Why only on the 24th of March? When you have all this evidence, when on the 16th of January, you already had, and go back to the 28th of October when there was huge suspicion and the reports that you then got already. Why do you wait until the 24th of March to activate the track and trace team to try to arrest him? And we see it was literally two weeks later and he was arrested, Tuff, like that. He was arrested. And thankfully, as the Honorable Breitenbach said earlier, thankfully he did not commit another offense in this time, thankfully. But it's to no benefit of the department because you had the information Commissioner, on the 16th of January, an escape is reported. Why didn't you, on that date, have the activation team to track and trace him on that date? And why did you wait till the 24th of March? 
Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. We have presented uh, to the committee through the report that we have submitted that, yes, the case was opened on the 16th of January. In the same presentation, we are, in, we are indicating that the National Commissioner became aware that the case was opened in the meeting that was convened on the 23rd of March when the final investigation report was discussed with the investigators, the regional management uh, committee and, uh, and uh, colleagues uh, from management in the department. The uh, media statement was issued out as uh, one has indicated on the 25th. The tracking team, the tracking team was appointed in the morning of the 24th of March. We finished the meeting after 12 o'clock, immediately after finishing the meeting, confirming the facts. I then uh, uh, issued out an instruction to put together the tracking and tracing team, which started its work at that time. Thank you very much. But may I suggest with the greatest respect that it's not necessary to wait to a final report before you have the track and trace team. I'm sure that can't be your policy. Surely when you have an escape, you should activate the track and trace team immediately and that you don't have to wait for a final report, even if there is some doubts. Is that not truly your policy? Uh, Chairperson. Five minutes left. Uh, Chairperson. Minister, minister, I think the minister wants to comment, or someone. Yeah, no. I just wanted to come on this point because I also asked the National Commissioner the same question uh, when these suspicions were becoming uh, loud around November or so. That, but why don't you just go and arrest and test this alleged person who is outside? And he said to me, look, there, there, there are a number of issues involved. Uh, one is that we don't know whether it's him or not. The first thing the police are going to ask me is whether do we have a warrant of arrest and so forth. So the first thing that needs to happen is that an escape must be declared uh, uh, first. Uh, then the track and tracing team uh, can, 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 can come into the, into the space. So it's, a, it's not like a normal straightforward escape. When it is known this prisoner just leaves, then we declare immediately the track and tracing team. So there were still some complexities, and the national commissioner can answer for himself. I'm just bringing it this to bear that those were some of the engagements we had, even ourselves behind the scene. But why don't we just Thank go Thank and you, fetch this one? I, I appreciate mm. that. Thanks, and I've only got two minutes. But I do want to just make the point that we've got to see this against the background of a lot of media coverage at this stage already. And on the 16th of January, Minister, even the 16th of January, a case of escape is reported. On that day, the track and trace team should have been activated because there you report a case, you've got enough evidence, and you report a case. But I'll leave it at that. Uh, the, uh, Commissioner, just the last issue. I raised this, and I just want an explanation from someone. On the 17th of March, you, someone in the department issued a statement about so-called leaks from unidentified sources and suggested that information supplied by these unauthorized so sources were putting undue pressure on the department to confirm or deny these reports. Now, you were getting continuous comments and from ground up. So please confirm this. Please answer this. No response. No response. No response. And then a, a, almost a chilling um, media report is saying, please, Stop putting pressure on us. In other words, and I appreciate there might be a lot of invalid things that are coming your way, but here is ground up sending you information, sending you requests, and you almost say, stop putting pressure on us. Is this not a form of a contempt almost for whistleblowers, or are you not taking them seriously, and should you not consider going forward taking greater note of what these investigative journalists are saying and the information. I put the same information to SAPS and they said, yes, we, we, we can make use of that. Um, that would be my last question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. No, from, uh, from our side, uh, let me just uh, concede that uh, we do not uh, uh, take that as contempt, number one. Number two, the, the information that, uh, that was, was, was received by us is information that was also uh, treated by the investigators. Um, 
the statement that was issued out at that point was to indicate to the public that we should work together because obviously there were those reports that we were, we were receiving that were really uh, uh, misleading. I can give uh, one example, for instance, um, with the, the offenders, uh, Honorable Chairperson, who would report instances of having information about the, 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 the by that time, the, the escape. Some of them actually, uh, to this uh, uh, date, they are still indicating that they were able to see someone walking up and down um, um, uh, Broadway. But at that time of the escape, offenders were locked up. The, the structure of the cell door is that there is a, there's, that there's a space where you can be able to, 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 to peep through with bars, but there's a flip that seals the cell. And, and, and that flip uh, uh, that seals the cell can only be lifted up from outside, not from inside. If you are to, to lift it from inside, it will be difficult for you to even make the person who's walking up and down the corridor. Now, th th this is the type of information that you have to sift through uh, when, you, when you do an investigation or when you get alerts and you follow that up. Uh, where it's useful, you, you utilize it. Where it's not useful, of course, uh, you just focus on the work at hand. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Engelbrecht. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, National Commissioner, uh, I just want to clear something up that came to the fore during uh, this morning's uh, que question and answer session with the inspecting judge um, relating to the regional commissioner. The DCS controllers that is stationed at the G4S Mangaung facility, do they report to the regional commissioner or not? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The controllers report to the director of contract management at head office. So would that then mean that the PPP facilities uh, do not fall under the regional and provincial DCS structures, but di falls directly under national head office? Yes, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, then, um, when it comes to uh, the department invoking section 112 about an event that occurred a year ago, I'm, I'm rather concerned. The um, reason being is that um, I hope that you are sure that the state of affairs at that facility prior to you invoking section 112 uh, was of such a nature that the invoking of this section would be uh, upheld by a court of law. Because after our conversations with G4S, I am utterly convinced that they will take the department to court and they will question the invoking of section 112. And I'm not sure if historic events can be used as a reason to evoke 112 now, not knowing if those uh, events were still prevalent just prior to the department invoking section 112. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. In the Are they not part of what they've sought legal opinion on? Uh, yeah, no, I don't think you have to answer. I'm, I'm just stating a concern, and I hope yeah. that these things okay. are in order. Then, I, think um, I think the concern would be noted. <laughs> Um, then to end off, and I'm not going to take 15 minutes, um, Mr. Chair, uh, we've heard from everyone 
involved now, and um, so we can come to a conclusion in our own minds. And mine is the following. Uh, the inspecting judge shared public information with Ground Up. Ground Up published the story. Because of the publication, the public's interest uh, became focused on this issue after a while. And I'm convinced that because of the public outcry, we are sitting here today. So I think it can be derived that had the inspecting judge not shared the information with ground up, we would have been none the wiser and Bester would in all probability still be roaming around freely. From my perspective, uh, the inspecting judge shared this information with the journalist because of the numerous attempts by him to get the minister and DCS to act has failed, and this is evident in the timeline where we see when things were done. The inspecting judge during his questions and answer session was understandably uh, very kind in respect uh, of the minister. I mean, he has to work with, with the minister. However, despite his kindness, he felt compelled to share the information with the journalists with the hope of eliciting a public outcry to get the minister and the department to do their job. And I think us sitting here right now is a testament to the inspecting judge being 100% correct in his assumptions. So, having said that, and you can comment on it, or you can, you don't have to if you don't want to, but I want to know from uh, Minister Lamola, seeing all of these failures, and if we talk about the concept of accountability, Mr. La Lamola, will you resign as a minister because of this debacle? Thank you. That's all I have. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe on firstly, on the 112 intervention, I hope that the Honorable Ongobrak is not suggesting that with all that is in front of us, everything is under control at the Mangaung Correctional Facility. Secondly, on your question whether I will resign or not, no, I'm not going to resign because I did what <coughs> I was supposed to do. And you will have heard even the, the judge that, as he informed me, he was not also informing me with certainty that Mr. Bester has escaped. He said there's a suspicion that is being investigated by the SAPS, by DCS, including the inspecting judge, which I immediately called the National Commissioner. To say, National Commissioner, I was on a call with the inspecting judge. These are the issues he's saying. This thing does sound unbelievable, but if it comes from a judge, you need to act on it, which is what I was supposed to do, and I've done it. Unfortunately, I cannot instruct the National Commissioner to go and arrest the person. Neither can I instruct the SAPS to go and arrest the person. Because as you may be aware, Mr. Engelbrecht, is, is the jurisdiction of the investigating officer to decide when and how to effect an arrest. But I did inform the National Commissioner of my discussion with the judge, which I told him that the judge did say this thing sounds unbelievable, but he is a judge. He believes that this suspicion needs to be followed up. So let's follow it up. And from time to time, I will definitely call the National Commission, even when we receive the questions sometimes from the media and so forth to say, how far is the investigations? And that is when I answered 
when uh, Honorable Swart was uh, asking that at some stage he told me that this thing has become broader than just them investigating an escape. Uh, these multiple bodies, in fact, the, the, the police believe this could be something bigger than what they see. So we should not do anything that could jeopardize the investigation. Hence, I confined my discussion between myself and the National Commissioner on this issue because of the nature and the sensitivity that was becoming apparent to me. But I understood the agency and the need to put pressure uh, on him. And I do think that when you look at the timelines from when the National Commissioner was doing follow-ups and so forth, it is also after many times I prompted him. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Just one thing. Uh, the minister uh, referred to Section 112. I just want to make it clear. I'm not saying that the things at Mangahung G4S is by any means wonderful right now. I raised a concern after studying the contract between DCS and, uh, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I have an opinion that according to what I read there, and I might be wrong and I hope I'm wrong, that there might be a financial risk for the department, which is something that we do not want. I just want to make that clear. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the department will act legally and rationally. Thank you very much, Honorable Horn. Thank you, Chair. Um, maybe I must start off while the minister is on the floor to touch base with the minister on uh, the statement he made uh, around his responsibility in respect of DCS being primarily oversight in nature. It's, of course, different to our, our oversight, Minister. I hope you would agree. Um, and if we, for a moment, accept that answer, also in light of the fact that you said we have failed and we take responsibility, what then in hindsight, should you have done differently? F firstly, you will have uh, heard, Honorable One, that uh, I'm clear that we must apologize for the fact that Mr. Best escaped from our facility, which is a facility operated by G4S. And I said, while it is operated by G4S on behalf of the South African government, the ultimate responsibility lies with the South African government. It lies with the Department of Correctional Service. The South African public does not know G4S. They know us. So it's us who must apologize to the South African public for this escape. And that is the responsibility I'm taking. Okay, let, let, let's stay with your oversight responsibilities. Uh, we, we only, it's now well known, we only have two public-private partnerships in respect of, of correctional facilities in this country. So as the minister, what have you done to ensure that the oversight, the monitoring, the evaluation in terms of this, the agreement in respect of Mangoon Correctional Center is properly Done. is to request uh, reports during the management, uh, the ministerial management meetings, and also to request them to tell us what is the process that DCS has started uh, in anticipation of the takeover of the facility in 2026. And as we speak now, there is a team from DCS working on the process of the takeover, uh, despite this process that we're dealing with in terms of, um, of the legal opinion that was seeking mm -hmm. in relation to the current situation, whether we should terminate or not, and whether we'll have the capacity to take over or not at this stage. So since my arrival, I've been very clear that we are not going to extend this 25-year contract so the department must start to prepare 
the processes of takeover and there's been many activities of monitoring. I know that the Deputy Minister has also visited uh, these centers, including uh, the Kuntama Sintimule and so forth, in that process of monitoring and also enhancing the process of the takeover. Okay, so have you considered the risks um, involved in public-private partnerships in general, long-term uh, public-private partnerships, uh, the risk involved, which is accepted globally, that towards the end of a longer-term contract, evaluation and oversight is, is neglected, and linked to that, your, your announcement, which I'm not saying you were not entitled to make, but your announcement already that come 2026 we're taking over there. Have you, have, what have you done to mitigate those risks? Yeah, as I've said, the Honorable Horn, there are teams, as we speak now, mm. from DCS, dealing with all those issues, the risk, the cost, the number of employees there, how many will we need, how many are retiring, how many are we taking over, what could be the risk, what type of profile and all that. So they are dealing with everything related to that uh, process, including the risks. And what have they found? One is that... Um, the, 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 what you have seen there is a presentation. For example, the, the private-public partnerships, they use a different system in terms of the grading of the offenders. They start with the AEA+, which is a higher kind of privilege, and then they work them down. It's a philosophy that they are running. While DCS is opposite, uh, you start from zero, where you have got nothing, until you gain your points of good behavior and so forth. Which we have agreed that that should be uh, harmonized. It must be in line with the DCS process. Mm. And also the discrepancies with regard to the salaries, that uh, it looks like they are paid more a bit, which the department might not really afford, particularly the, the officials. And it looks like uh, there's about 30% or so in Mangaung that is soon going to, to retirement. So there's a number of things that they did find, which I think will be helpful as we move forward. Okay. So, so talking about those officials, one of the things that of course is now on the table is that come 2026 they have an un uncertain future. Now your agreement with, with Group 4 Security say they may not make use of any custody officials who are not certified and you can even, in some instances, revisit the certification. A lot has been said about the uh, lack of G4S to do lifestyle audits and according to your own report, their own intelligence operations were weak. Have your team considered recertifying the Group 4 security officials there as part of a risk management in the run-up to 2026? I think the, the NSC can answer that one. Oh, the controller and so forth. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The, the, the HR processes with regards to, to take over includes uh, lifestyle audits. We have already indicated that with Mangaung, with the takeover at the moment, that's one of the things that we're going to do. Um, and then uh, we have already identified that there's a different grading system in terms of uh, salaries, as the minister has indicated, and we've also identified that there's a need for, for reskilling or retraining, especially of uh, correctional officials, because the training that uh, the, the Mangaung correctional officials go through in terms of uh, intensity and time is less than the, uh, the training that we take our own correctional officials through. So those are the details that the, the, the task teams have been uh, uh, tasked to, to work on. There's an action plan that we did present to the portfolio committee and uh, we are ready uh, upon uh, uh, being invited to the portfolio committee to give more progress with regards to the details that we have uncovered. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Chair, my next question uh, is, is around the, 
the periodic reviews which the contract makes provision for. Am I correct to understand that it fir at first it was agreed that those would happen quarterly, but of late that has not happened quarterly? Yeah, yes, you are correct uh, uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, you are correct, Honorable Member. Yeah, and, 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 and now with the benefit of hindsight, would you agree that quite possibly a, a keeping up the quarterly reviews could maybe have assisted to prevent what happened? Yes, I agree uh, uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, I agree, Honorable Member. Uh, let me indicate that uh, the quarterly reviews um, are done by the supervisory committee, but through the reporting system of the department, uh, we also get the region to include the information from G4S in the quarterly reports that we consider as management of the department on the performance of the correctional system. Mm -hmm. Hence, when we also meet on a weekly basis to look at the, the performance of correctional facilities through the National Operations Committee. We also include the information and reports from uh, Mangaun Correctional Facility. A actually, um, the latest report that was done on the infrastructure and the operations of the fire system at Mangaun was done in the last six months, which is what uh, we also provided uh, to the contractor. Okay. Um, I, I just want National Commissioner to touch base with you regarding your response to the question by the Honorable Engelbrecht, because I have it that the job, job description of the controller entail a first line of reporting to the Deputy Regional Commissioner in question before the I want to say parallel and separate reporting line to the uh, direct national director contract management. Uh, you answered that the only reporting line is to the contract management director. Um, are you quite sure about your information? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, I am sure. I have just indicated, uh, Honorable Chairperson, that when, with regards to operational information that we aggregate for the correctional system, the region uh, collects that information uh, and submits to management. But when it comes to the performance, the work of the controllers, when it comes to the tasking of the controllers, uh, reporting uh, in terms of their performance contracts and accountability, they are directly accountable to the director contract management. That's why even in terms of the investigation that they instituted uh, after appointing the investigators, that investigation report went from the, uh, the controllers to the director contract management. There, there is no line between that intercepted that, uh, that, uh, that investigation. It is just a, a, a line that provides information. It's not a line that provides management and control. Thank you. Um, then in, in respect of the um, complaints or violation notices, we, we see in the report that you, you report um, for the mo mo most recent period, would you be able to furnish us with a longer period, maybe five years so that we can see the trend of violation notices, the numbers, uh, the type of violation notices, um, I don't, I can't insist on it now or the detail of it now, but would you be able to do that, please? Four minutes. Thank you, Chair. We, we will be able to do that uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Chair, then, with your permission, I want to move back to the Minister. Uh, Minister, as part of your oversight functions, um, in respect of the previous uh, national commissioner, uh, what was your, your oversight of his exit activities at the time? So the, the decisions he took, uh, 
uh, during the, the let's say the, the the last few weeks or months of his of his tenure after having of course being informed that his contract would not be extended it was the same as I arrived so what would that be the normal oversight reports what is happening in the quarterly reports that are necessary, the management committee meetings, and uh, everything that is supposed to be to be done. So, wouldn't you agree that, in respect of a director general, which in essence the national commissioner is, whenever there is a contract to be, to come to an end, uh, there will have to be transitional arrangements in place and that your obligation will be to have a very careful oversight so that there's no last minute decisions that ultimately come back to haunt the department. That's just as a matter of principle in general. Let's forget about the personalities involved. I hope, uh, Honorable Hon, you are not suggesting uh, micromanagement because uh, I know you, 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 you may not want that. I will definitely, from time to time, get reports. And if there is something, uh, I will also call him to provide certain reports. Uh, there were a number of exchanges for this report and that report. And obviously, I also monitored him and so forth. But mm. also, when he thinks that uh, there is something he may want to report, he will report and, and all that. Okay. And then my, my, my final question, and I don't know whether I must look towards you, because obviously it's not fair to ask the new national commissioner. But are you aware or were you made aware that the visit to the Mangaung Center on the very last day of Mr. Fraser's service was necessitated by complaints from Group 4 security that the, the then controllers were overreaching and issuing too many violation notices and, and that they, they really should be moved in order to restore our harmonious relationship. No, I'm not aware of that. And will you be able to find out? Yeah, you can get the report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Uh, members have realized that uh, aircon is not working properly and there's no water. And when the minister said that uh, when the body was dead, I realized that <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get a, <laughs> to get a body break. <laughs> So it is, let's have it, uh, how, how many minutes? Oh, I'm told that dinner is outside. Can we come back at, huh? Yeah, can we come back, huh? Can we take 30 minutes? Five, 10, 15. Can we come back at 20 past?
to give to Honorable Nivot Duchen. She will be followed by Honorable Yako. Honorable Yako will be followed by Honorable Ramulube, and then Honorable Koza. The last one will be Honorable Janji, in that order. Thank you, Chair. Um, for DCS, I wanted to go to slide six because I wanted to understand the public-private partnership structure and how it works. Slide six, you have um, five entities, the 20% that each has. Now, I wanted to know where does the department fit into that? Um, do those entities then report to the department? Because if each of the entities, like G4S, you know, those entities, where does the department um, fit in, or and where does, does G4S then fit in in light of what happened? I just wanted to understand that part. Sorry, Honorable Nubut I was distracted a bit. Do you want me to repeat the question, Chair? Please. Don't deduct my minutes. No, no. <laughs> no, we are starting now. Okay, in slide number six, I wanted to understand the public private partnership, how it's structured, and how does it work. So there it shows the five entities, and I'm assuming that the 20% is the shares. So where does DCS fit into all of this? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, the Department of Correctional Services is contracted to the Bloemfontein um, uh, contract, uh, concession contract, basically meaning that uh, you have a consortium of those uh, uh, um, shareholders that you that are, appear on slide number six. So, in the light of what happened with the fire, it's only G4S who takes responsibility. The rest don't take any responsibility for the fire at all. It is actually the, the consortium. Um, G4S has a role as a contracted operator. That's why when we uh, gave um, G4S the notice of takeover, we actually referred to the, the consortium. Even when we answered to the, the letter of legal contest, we indicated that we can only deal with the consortium. Okay, fine, thank you. And then go to slide 16. There are 50 disputes with G4S, and I'm assuming that these disputes cover, is covered from 2022-23 financial year? Uh, I'm going to request that the acting deputy commissioner in the office of the national commissioner uh, talk to that slide on the disputes through you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, uh, National Commissioner. Uh, the slides on disputes uh, with G4S is actually handled by the acting director, advocate George Matlangu. So with your permission, uh, Chairperson, I'm going to request him to please respond on this one. Thank you. Yeah, no, Honorable Chairperson, uh, through you, let me just uh, respond. The, 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 the National Commission, you're saying I must respond? No, no, <laughs> I'm saying through you, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the, these are disputes that covers the past three years, up to uh, January 2023. Okay, so normally these disputes, when do they get resolved 
um, because the contract is ending in 2026. So when do you expect these disputes to be resolved? And through you, Honorable Chairperson, the disputes are resolved in the sittings of the Supervisory Committee. Um, at the moment, the Supervisory Committee is not sitting because there is a vacant seat of a, an expert, an external expert, who is supposed to be appointed. The process of appointing the external ex, uh, expert is underway. Uh, I think by now the, 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 the closing date has, has passed and uh, ourselves and, uh, and the consortium, the department and the consortium is supposed to sit through a process of appointment of an external uh, expert. Okay, thank you. I would just like to add in support of what Honorable Horn recently asked. I would also like to see um, how many disputes you've had over the past five years and then when these disputes have been resolved. I'd like, um, like Honorable Horn asked and requested that information, I would also like that. And then the temporary management Again, the structure, I would like to know how it works. The temporary management is now in charge of MCC. Now, yesterday, G4S explained the structure of the three directors. Now, where do they fit in with the temporary management, or do these three then fall away? I understand you said that G4S is still there, but these are director positions. So where do they fit in with the temporary management and the temporary direct? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The temporary manager came in to um, take over from the centre director, meaning that in the 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 space that is, uh, the box that is in the middle, in that structure, where it is indicated that the centre director of MCC is Mr. Joseph Munyanti. In that space, that's where you have the temporary manager. Okay, so the other two are still there and work together as a team? They are still there and work together as a team, but with regards to the management and the functioning of the center, the temporary manager will then um, take the final decision. Okay. You listed in your slides all of the disputes, all the violations and failures. Oh, so what is going to be done about those? What guarantee do we as women, especially the women of South Africa have, you know, understanding clearly that there, will be no, there hasn't been any more escapes, um, it wouldn't be as easy as that was, especially with this team still there. So what guarantee can you give that this will not happen again? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. In the presentation, um, there is a slide where we are presenting the action plan that will be followed by the team and the temporary manager. We are already implementing that uh, action plan. That's why at this moment we can say with certainty that all the inmates, all the offenders that are at uh, Mangaung Correctional Center have been accounted for, meaning that we have uh, checked their fingerprints against the records that are there. We have also taken uh, photos of them and checked uh, so the, the photos. So every offender that is in that facility as we speak has been accounted for. So those actions are the actions that we are implementing and uh, monitoring as we, as we go. And as I've indicated, we have control of those uh, um, actions. Um, if I can just give an example, there, there was a, a number of, of uh, offenders that uh, were resisting to be verified, and we insisted on that happening. And because of the, the control we have over the facility, 
all of them ended up being um, verified with the assistance of the EST team from Hotflay and also with the, the employees that are there at uh, MMC. Thank you, Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, Honorable Nivot Strohan. Honorable Yako. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think uh, for the sake of uh, progress, I'm going to just do uh, maybe a preamble, ask a few questions based on this report, and then pose some questions to the Minister. Um, I think we've, we've been deliberating on this for two days now, and I've, we're extremely tired, um, and I don't think we have any tangible answers or any tangible kind of direction as to where we should go, um, and nothing is coming out. If I'm going to say it in this close, from what we are doing, and I hope um, at some point we're going to keep picking at it until something comes out and something and remedies are made. Um, there's three elephants here, but the biggest elephant is the white elephant, which is G4S, um, which has hindered progress across. And I think they've had their way for a very long time, and which is why they have made this work so difficult that we are here now where we are. Um, we've gone to uh, uh, correctional service centers, uh, the co commissioner will know. Um, we've seen what they can do with the resources that they have. I'm, taking up, I'm talking about state-owned ones, state-run ones. We've seen how you deal with overcrowding. We've seen how you are able to be self-sustainable in some. We've seen how you're able to have animals, breed, uh, make furniture from scratch, rehabilitate. We've seen all those things. Um, also, we've seen how G4S is a cut above the rest. And primarily because of the seven billion that we've spent over the 20 years for G G4S. Um, and for me, it begs the question as to how, why did it take so long for correctional services and the ministry to decide on terminating that contract? Because it seemed to me, had this not been a, a factor right now, it would have maybe been renewed in 2024. So um, that concerns me. Um, and then moving to the report, um, I'm just going to ask a few questions. So on page seven, you've got a graph there. I don't know if you can go to it now. Slide 14. Yes. No, 14. Yeah. So you say there, this is your report as from 2017 to 2023. And you had an incident in 2022 when someone died of unnatural causes, and that is not recorded there. There's a zero. Um, you've got a death, but there's nothing, the death investigation, and you've got zero in 2022. And it should have been recorded that you had an incident that happened in 2022 of Tabo Besta who killed himself, but it's not recorded there. And I'm wondering why that is. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, we are not report reporting it as an unnatural death. We are reporting it as an escape. In, 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 in the, in the uh, financial year 2022, we had two escapes, the one in May and the one in December. We are reporting it as, a, as, a, as an escape. But you had not captured it as an escape at the time of 2022 then. Should you not then reconfigure that in 2023 to say, we had thought it was an unnatural death at the time because that's what you reported. That's what you claimed it was, and G4A's claimed that there was a death of Tabo Besta at the time. And you should have then reconfigured it in 2023 to say no. Now that the evidence has come through, true, we are then lessening that to A. Or that should have been an addendum to that graph because then it doesn't make sense. Um, through you, Honorable Chairperson, I agree with the Honorable Member. This um, report is a report that was prepared for the Portfolio Committee as of this period 
um, after obviously um, the, 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 the financial year 2022. Um, if this report was, and it is after, of course, we have received our final report. And now, if this report, this presentation, this slide was worked on before we received our final report, it would reflect as, a, as an unnatural death. But you do note that it reads as untrue based on the evidence that you had in 2022 and now, without a side note saying that what, what should have happened is this, what was recorded in 2022 is this. That's what I want to flag. Um, secondly, um, National Commission, on page eight, you talk about an integrated security system that's able to detect um, able to detect cell phones in the facilities. And how do you think that Tabo Besta was found with a cell phone in, in his cell? If that integrated security system that you've put here, which I think, had I been you, I would have taken out because that's not what it did. It did not take that cell phone that came into his cell at the time. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I, well, our report shows that um, the officials that were managing the control rooms did not do their work, um, including the fact that even cameras were tampered with. So the system is there. It has this uh, uh, um, functionalities, but we still rely on honest officials that are committed to do their work to do their work. Now, when we find out that they have not done their work, we, we implement consequence management but the systems are there. They are trained and there is on-site support at all times. If something goes wrong with the system, it shows and the technicians on-site are supposed to, at to attend to it, but technicians can only attend to it if it is reported. And also if it is reported and te technicians don't attend to that um, error, also those technicians obviously will be found wanting through investigation processes and that's what our investigation report is indicating. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 11, um, there's a sequence of events that you've outlined here, and maybe the minister will come in and with you, Commissioner, and, and, and make me understand why you would have a meeting. Um, so it says, SEPS informed G4S that they changed the inquest to a homicide, and G4S informed DCA's controller on the 6th of June. Um, and it seems to me, and then DC, the outcome of this investigation was not provided to DCS until the 31st of March. And you then add a bit of a part there, which I think is, 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 is a way of apologizing for your inaction, which says that the letter from G4S, however, indicates the death of Inmo Tabo Besta was now a homicide, meaning that they still consider the body as that of Tabo Besta. So you, you allowed the narrative of a Tabo Besta who was then murdered but the name Tabo Besta still remains there, even though you knew that that person who died there or the person who was brought there dead was not the person. Um, why, would, why would you allow DC, I mean G4S to only give you that investigation a year later? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. We did indicate upfront in the presentation and in the report the difficulties that we faced with getting information from G4S, the evasiveness, and outright refusal. We have the, 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 the evidence in the investigation report. And as DCS, you don't have control over G4S whatsoever. They just allowed to say to you, we're not going to give you what you want. We have uh, taken steps. That's why we continued with our investigation. And uh, the recommendations are pointing to the fact that we need to issue out notices in line with the contract uh, to deal with the this uh, uh, you know, type of, of, of transgressions or non-compliance, but also as we are sitting here uh, this evening, we, are, we have taken control of the facility and it is for that reason. But if we go back to 6 June, at that time, the department had not received, let me put it this way, the investigators had not received the autopsy and DNA reports. Um. On page 13, you say findings of the investigation. Um, the sequence of events outlined in the report substantiates that there were a number of breaches on the contract. 
leading up to the escape of Tabo Besta. Um, and to the minister, what is going to happen with regards to these breaches to this contract? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairperson. One uh, thing that maybe I must correct, uh, Honorable Yak, when you started, you said maybe we are saying we will not renew the contract because of this incident. We have said it many years ago. Even in this committee, we have also said it, that our intention is that when the contract uh, expires, in 2026, we do not have any intention to extend it or to renew it. We said it in this committee. We have also said it in public. And with regard to the question you're asking now, is that it is part of the issue of the legal opinion. What then should be done with all these breaches? Because um, as you are aware, and you, as you will have seen, there are a lot of litigations between the department and MCC. So whatever decisions that we need to take must be informed by, must be based on, must be based on proper legal basis. That's your final answer? Yes. Okay. Unless you want us to litigate in this house. Uh, that's not needed. That comment was really not needed, Minister. Um, What is the obligation of DCAs with regards to the body that was found? The body that was not Tabo Besta, that was found on the premises of G4S. Uh, the obligation of DCS would be to report the incident to the police, which was duly done. Um, in the instance that uh, uh, let me go back to the first report that we received that uh, this was an, an unnatural death. One of the things that we tested through our investigators is to check if G4S did inform the next of kin. And the response that we received from G4S was that they could not find the next of kin because we wanted to get to the point where the body gets to be uh, you know, uh, given to, the, uh, to Dr. Maguduma. So our investigators actually called the next of kin that is indicated in the profile of uh, Tabo Bester, who is the uncle. And just with one phone call, we're able to connect with the uncle. So if we have an offender um, that uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, dies through a natural death or any kind of, of or even a, a, an incident uh, of harm that happens to an offender, we report to the police and we inform the next of kin. No, Apart from the, the medical treatment and other treatments Sorry, that we then I just provide. want you to backtrack a bit. So you're saying that when you found the body, you were able to get in touch with the uncle? Uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson, yes. Yes, Honorable Member. So why did G4S come here and say to us that they were unable to get a hold of the uncle and then they then handed the body over to the to Makutum? Five that minutes. I'll be done. Uh, thank you, Mr. That is the that is the, the the basis of the outcome of our report as we were investigating. That's what we are indicating in the report. So what G4S is saying is false. That they were unable to get hold of the uncle, <coughs> so that the body would then be handed over to the next person because you were able to get hold of the uncle. Three, Honourable Chairperson, that's exactly what I'm saying. It is in our in our report, and we have records of that uh, uh, interaction. Actually, even the, um, the official of G4S that was charged with this responsibility was interviewed and there is an affidavit that talks to the, to the account of G4S, but we have our own account. So Mr. Grunewald and Mr. Grunewald basically came here and lied to the house to say that they could not get hold of the uncle on the day. Um, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, just one last thing. How many days have been recorded at MCC that are unnatural? Uh, Honorable Chairperson, I would request that we go back to the table. You recorded zero there. Yeah. 
It, um, we have listed this according to uh, financial years. And we are referring to which financial year, honourable no, no, member? It's, it's, Apologies. It's fine, Commissioner. I'm covered. I, I just am <laughs> covered. I did answer this question you did, before. Yeah, you did. Yes. So, you so did. that's why I'm saying yeah, which year are we referring did. to? No, I'm, I'm yes. covered. Just one second, last thing, Chair. Um, looking at the gravity of the matter that we have at hand right now, looking at the fact that you apprehended Tabo Besta and he's now in Hosimabur, how secure are you that you are going to keep him safe? so that whoever orchestrated any of this is unable to get hold of him. Because if they can take a body and put it and plant it in a cell at maximum prison, they're able to do anything to him right now. How are you making sure that he is safe right now in order to account fully until this process is over and we can find out who was involved and how deep this goes? Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. The the, the, the standard that we apply uh, to offenders of high risk um, um, like Tabo Pester is the same. Obviously, we also look at the, the type of crimes that uh, that offender would be uh, uh, saving for or sentenced for. I think can uh, you guarantee his safety or not? He is safe in terms of the security plan that we have put in place. Okay. Um, just lastly, Minister, are you happy with your performance with regards to this? Yeah, I have done what um, I was supposed to do and uh, ensured that um, after I was informed by the inspecting judge, I informed the National Commissioner who told me of the <coughs> investigation that is already underway which um, unfortunately he said he could not share it at the preliminary stages because it was still at infancy. The information was not enough at that time because I asked him, but why didn't you tell me about this? And that's what he said. And um, I emphasized the issue that this matter is important. It must be prioritized. And I followed up. And from time to time, he will tell me that it's a sensitive matter. There is multiple bodies. There is an ongoing investigation that we must not jeopardize. But there is investigation that is underway and is being attended to. Thank you very much. So, Chair, I think I have a minute. I'll give it to Fosi. <laughs> OK, Honorable Koza. Chair, it's me. Oh, okay, okay. So, so you will have 11 minutes, 16, 16 minutes. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Honorable Ramulube. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> My voice is a bit quirky. I don't know whether I'm developing flu or uh, throat, or maybe it's because of us being, we've been speaking a lot for the past two days. Uh, Chair, let me welcome the report from the DCS and the minister. Um, afternoon again, colleagues, or evening now. Uh, chair, or oh, minister and the, the, the national commissioner, how much would you say the G4S would have to pay if there's, um, there's an escape in the, what would be the amount of the penalty, if there is an escape in the facility, how much is it? I'm not speaking of those monies of litigation, Minister, that you've made of the penalty if there is an escape in the, in the MMC. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I'm going to ask the acting director, contract management, to respond to the issue, the question. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairperson. Normally, in cases of uh, escape, uh, the observation fine is just under one million. So that is what should be expected uh, uh, for G for S to pay. What is under one million? Even one rand is under one million. <laughs> I was about to say that. 
precisely um, 900,000. Can we get accuracy of that report, please? Um, and, and, and also have a report of how many escape actually would have transpired in the MCC. Uh, bearing in mind also our oversight visit that we did last day in April, uh, the mention of the escapes that they would have transpired, including the Tabo Bester one, including the one in December um, of the person who escaped in the hospital. Can we, through you, Chair, get that, that detail, detailed report? Commissioner, you, you, you made an indication that you got to be aware of the escape in January. Is that correct? I got to be aware of the escape after receiving the report. The report I received on the 22nd of March. So in January, you were not unaware of a possible escape from someone or anything? In January? Yes, 2023. Was, 2023. I was aware of a draft investigation report that was uh, submitted by the investigators um, through the controller to the director contract management. Yeah, it was a draft report which had uh, information that pointed to the escape uh, with all the information that was supporting that. That is the report that I followed up um, the director contract management on to say that you have received a report. It's, um, we need to finalize this report so we can be able to firstly report the escape to SAPS and we can then put in motion our own processes of tracking and tracing. The response that I received was that uh, at that time, uh, the director was still considering the report and additional information. So it would not be a report that would put me in a position of reliability in terms of uh, uh, concluding that definitely there is an escape. An assurance based on the report says on the 12th of January, the controller would have opened an escape, an escape case, WhatsApps. That is on your, um, on your report. Who is the official that opened a case? The one who is a controller in the MCC, who is based in the MCC? Uh, three honorable chairperson is Mr. Mahonono. What would have happened since with Mr. Mahonono? three months later after opening that case? What is the current status of that person right now? Mr. Mr. Uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson, Mr. Maonono is uh, contemplated for suspension. We are continuing with the investigations under the unit, uh, departmental investigation unit. He is also uh, currently providing information and statements that we need for us to investigate broader um, the role of G4S in the, in the whole um, incident. Do you suspect any foul, foul play from his side to be equally implicated in this plan to get best escape? Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson. In answering that question, I would say that as the department, we are at this moment not convinced that he acted with due care with regards to his responsibilities. And we are <coughs> pointing to that in the report. For instance, on the Saturday of that long weekend, uh, Mr. Mo, uh, Mahonono uh, visited the correctional facility. He always does that. And he goes to three places. He goes to the control room. He goes to the kitchen and he goes to Broadway. But on that night, he did not go to Broadway. These are some of the, 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 the issues that point out to the fact that he did not act with the care and the responsibility that was required of him. And he acted out of his uh, normal routine. But as I've indicated, we've contemplated him and we are actually getting more information from him and more statements, especially 
about um, inmates or offenders that can assist with more information and the officials of uh, G4S. Is he the only one suspended? He is not the only one. The director uh, contract management is suspended. Um, the deputy controller is contemplated for suspension. Both of them have been removed from Mangawu. Do you, when do you perhaps see you concluding the investigation? Especially around the implicated ones who are suspended currently. Um, Honorable Chairperson, without necessarily giving, you know, um, specific time frames, I would say that it would not take us more than two months from now to finalize that. Uh, because we need to take uh, these officials through disciplinary processes. And uh, there, there are timelines in terms of the Labor Relations Act and, uh, and the basic conditions of employment. Minister, I want to go back to an exchange between you and Honorable Breitenbeck, um, especially at the time that Justice Cameron was informing us um, regarding the telephone discussion between or vis-a-vis -vis the letter um, regarding the issue of Ma Mangawu. Did Justice Cameron in certainty mention that um, in your discussion or yeah, in your phone call discussion, that best there was out? No. It was still an uncertain thing that there is suspicion. And, um, but um, that there could be some credence that needs to be investigated. Hence, I immediately called the National Commissioner to say that uh, with this information coming from the judge that there could be some credence, we need to act with the priority on this matter. But it was not with certainty. There was still uncertainty, uncertainty whether it's true, whether it's possible. And it was still unbelievable. But I understood the fact that if it came from him, uh, it's a matter that needs, needs to action. be treated with agency. Yeah. Did he come back when it was certain that it, there is an escape of Tabo Pester in the, in the MCC to certain you now? No. Chair, I want to go to the contractual, the contract between DCS and, the, and Mangawu. I understand the... The, the discussion that says you are seeking legal um, recourse on the matter regarding getting out of the contract and so forth and so on. But I just want to go back. Yesterday, Honorable Kola made mention or raised an issue on the, the fire detectors um, in Broadway. And there was an indication that says they were not there. And there was a follow-up to say, didn't the, uh, the management of the center seat fit that chair? I'm being um, jigs is, and I hope I'm not, my time is not going to be taken by jigs chair. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, proceed, Honorable Ramulubia. Thank you. Chair, I made an indication that Honorable Ola yesterday made, raised an issue of fire detectors, and there was an indication that they're not there in Broadway, and there was a follow-up that says, didn't they see, see it fit that fire detectors should be put in place? Um, they raised issues of the contract between them and TCS, so, which does not um, allow them or permit them to do that. Clause 8 and Clause 9 of the main contract allows for a contractor to propose changes to the contract. In this instance, it means a G4S would be able to, um, uh, what do you call it, install those fire um, detectors. Is this true? Um, can really close eight and close nine speak to that? If indeed, um, are we able to have G4S installing them? 
so that we, we understand whether they wanted to install them um, or they just chose not to do it. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. It is um, true that there is a provision in the concession contract for that, um, uh, Section 8 and 9, and upon uh, application, uh, DCS would uh, consider that, and it is an improvement that is necessary uh, to enhance the security of the institution and will allow that to happen. Did G4S be made aware of that provision? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I would want to, to believe that they know about that provision. Um, uh, I think the main issue is that uh, they, they should have applied. But I must indicate that there was a, a, a review done of the infrastructure and uh, its uh, limitations, and the issue of uh, fire detectors was raised in that report, and that report was submitted to G4S. It was, it was, um, 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 it was the, the investigation or the review was done by the facilities unit from the Department of Correctional Services with the assistance of Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. You are left with two minutes plus one minute uh, of disturbance or three minutes. Thanks, Chair. What remedial action should be considered um, by the department, bearing in mind the embarrassment of this incident that it would have cost the country? Um, what remedial action do you propose should happen, um, Minister and um, National Commissioner? Um, we're sitting with a crisis that has put us, has plunged us into a serious embarrassment as, the, as, a, as a whole country. And two, do we have a roadmap to remedy ourselves in this whole situation? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Member. Um, the first uh, remedial action is uh, from our side, and we, we apologize for, for this incident. As the custodians of the, of the Correctional Services Act, we understand that this happened at the MCC G4S uh, operated facility. But we take responsibility because we are the custodian of the Correctional Services Act. That is the first remedial action, is to apologize to the country. And indeed, it was dangerous that this guy was let off the hook by the G4S officials. The second one is the one that we, we prefer not to go too much into it. Um, because of the legal implications, where we are still seeking a legal opinion on the issue of the termination of the contract or not and all that, and also assessing our own capability, whether we have the capacity to take over. Because as you will have seen from the presentation, uh, the facility has got about 500 and something seven. Yeah, employees. 507 Fi officials. 507 officials. So taking over can be an overnight thing. So you need to build that capacity. There is infrastructure, there is technology. There's a number of things that needs to be, to be considered. So all are, are the things that we are attending to and they will be able to, when we are ready, within a reasonable space of time, uh, inform the committee of our, our decision, of you. Um, immediately after getting that legal advice, I would propose, Chair, through you, that they do inform the committee so that we equally could have a say on what should, should happen. Because some of us, where we're sitting, we are vying for a total termination of the G4S contract. And sitting here, I understand the implication, Minister. Um, sitting here, I get worried if that should happen in two months' time. We seem not to be ready to take over the institution. Uh, um, it worries me sitting here. Um, because of my next question was going to be, are we ready to take over the institution if in two months' time we're given that opportunity? Because the situation we're facing, it can be correct. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, maybe we... So, so, sorry, Minister, before you answer, what was your proposal? I, I lost your first part, the first part of the proposal. I'm saying immediately after they seek the legal um, views, 
um, they must bring them to the committee so that we equally can contribute towards towards that, especially on the matter of termination of the chief OS contract. Chair. Yeah, Jefferson, I don't want to, to appear disrespecting the honorable member of parliament. I thought you were going to give guidance on that day. Request. We will, we will deal with it when we deliberate. Uh, okay. So the the reason I was saying, I, I, I was saying, Minister, is because as I was trying to, in fact, as I was asking her to repeat the response, we were already responding. So I thought because I had interrupted you that I must give back to you. No, no, I'm referring to. Okay, that issue. To her request, I okay. suspect you understand. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. We will Thank you. No, I'm fine, Chair. My minute, Chair, we can give it to Honorable Janji. No. No, there's nothing, but th there's something uh, th there's something suspicious about Honorable Janji and Honorable Horn. They disappear, they come late, but when there is the time to speak, one minute before they, w w then they come in. That's what happened yesterday with you. That's why your time was expropriated, half of your time. Now it's Honorable Janji. Yeah, so you're just in for, in the next 16 minutes, it will, it will be your time to, to close. Now it's Honorable Koza, then it will be you. Ngebonge Slalo, Tola Etuba. I just need to ask a question to the Commissioner or anyone from that uh, side. Is the person arrested in Tanzania the same person that escaped from MMC, MCC on the 3rd of May? If so, how do you know? And through you, Honorable Chairperson, it is the same person. Um, in the earlier session, SAPS did indicate that fingerprints of uh, this person were taken. They were meshed with the records that are there in the database of SAPS and our own database as DCS. Um, and that meshed, and it is on the basis on which um, even uh, the authorities from uh, Tanzania allowed the process of deportation to um, to, to take place. But also beyond the, the fingerprints, there is also uh, facial recognition of um, our own uh, officials from correctional services who uh, were charged with the responsibility of uh, watching over Tabo Bester before he was uh, transferred to Mangaum. They were part of the delegation that went to Tanz uh, Tanzania to do the identification. But I would, um, um, yeah, I would emphasize the fingerprint uh, 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 confirmation. OK, uh, thank you. Who is this person? That's why I said a person. I did not speak about Tabo Besta, because from what, from our earlier uh, action with SAPS, they were not sure if they've got Tabo Besta. They're saying there's, there's two other Tabo Pesters with IDs there, but this particular one does not have a, a South African ID, which makes it very difficult for him to be identified. My next question would be, how do you know that this person is indeed Tabo Pesta? It could be Vusi Koza, it could be Tabo Mkwen, or anyone else for that matter. Have you checked once, or, or is this a given name that you were given when you were arrested, arrived at your facility, gave you a name, Tabo Pesta. Did you do a different confirmation, either by death of a I mean, uh, um, uh, certificate from church, birth certificate, some letter from school, or even an ID document? What other form of confirmation have you done to say this person is indeed Tabo Pesta, or you just took the name that they gave, that he gave when he arrived at your facility? Um, through you, Honorable Chairperson, the, the, 
verification and the information I'm referring to is supported by the warrant that we received um, when we admitted Tabo Pester in the, in the earlier years of his uh, incarceration. But I've, I must also emphasize that the fingerprints were taken. They were matched with the fingerprints that were existing in the country, in the database of SAPS and our own database. Um, based on that, it was confirmed that the, the person who was in Tanzania at that time is the person who was once in the correctional system of South Africa. Can I interrupt, Chairperson, through you? I am saying the, the person, that's why we say the person, leave that Tanzania story, we've passed that. My question is, have you verified that this person is Tabo Pesta before now and, and now? Or you took a name that came with the warrant uh, and you went to the system and it said Tabo Pesta. I'm saying, have you independently verified? If I were to be arrested, I'll, I'll have my fingerprints taken or uh, my, my, my ID would be demanded to say, show us your ID or it's you, so we've got you, and this is your name. I'm asking a simple question. How do, did you do a different verification to say this person is a Tabo Pester or it's an imposter, a Vusi Kosa, using the name of Tabo Pester? Simple question like that, uh, Commissioner. I mean, uh, co co com Commissioner should be very simple, right? <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, through you, uh, Honorable Chairperson, this, this is not, in my view, it's not a simple question, and I can explain why. I have indicated in my, in my answer that, uh, um, okay, the first confirmation is that um, there's no ID identification of Tabo Pester, and he's not um, the first inmate or offender who is in that category. When they arrive, we take fingerprints, we compare with what we have in the warrant, we take uh, pictures, the mark shots, we file, and we allocate them a correctional services number. And we then track them through the system like that. Of course, the same fingerprints will match the fingerprints that will be there in the sub database and throughout the criminal justice system. So that is the basis on which we were able to ascertain that the person who is, was outside the system is Tabo Bester, as per the information that we have. Now, with regards to further verification, that is what the South African Police Service is busy um, investigating. Um, and with regards to other particulars of, of, of identity, that is what the Department of Home Affairs will also be able to address. But in as far as the correctional system is concerned, the person who is now back in the correctional system is Tabo Pester in terms of the information that is, we have. Is and a man known as Tabo Pester. Yeah, uh, Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say uh, in terms of what the commissioner says, in terms of our systems, that is our identification. But tomorrow, in the morning, I know the committee might not have that privilege or the time, but the Minister of Home Affairs will have a press briefing to explain exactly who is this person in terms of the national identification system of the country. Thank you very much, Minister. Th thank you, Chair. I think what the Minister has just said helps because the Commissioner was not helping at all. But uh, we shall wait for that uh, press briefing. Uh, we heard of the um, 112 intervention, current litigation, 110 million. For, uh, is that for a 2013 uh, incidence and the report that came up? It is for the 2013 intervention. All right. Uh, some of the information that I cleaned from that is that there was a gross violation of the rights of inmates. People were brutalized, tortured, etc., etc. What were, 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 were their consequences 
for the officials in that prison after that report. I'm sure that report came up with recommendations. Were there consequences for either G4S or the officials that were involved? There were consequences in line with the concession agreement. And we can provide that information as the department. Uh, through you, Chair, were certain people and individuals held accountable? When I say held accountable, Officer A and B and X and Y Z be reported to the police so that the police can investigate for torture. Uh, did G4S do something about their own officials who were involved in such brutal and inhuman uh, violation of inmates' rights? Or justify? Uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson, I have indicated that we can provide the details. At the moment, I do not have them with me. But I know that the outcome of that process uh, came up with recommendations and they were implemented based on the outcome. So you will provide that in writing? Yes, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That suffices. In Tabo Pesta's cell, no, my former cell, cell 35, an unauthorized laptop was found. No, an authorized, we were told it was an authorized laptop was found that was given to him for his use and a contraband cell phone that was illegally in there. G4S went on to say that, uh, uh, yes, uh, they would uh, at some point allow laptops for those who are studying, even if that was disputed to say Tabo Pesta finished studies long time ago. Here's my question. This laptop that Pesta was using, was it issued by the Department of Correctional Services or was it? it is his own personal laptop and how did that laptop get into the facility i remember yesterday uh, it was said that it was his personal web, uh, laptop okay 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 i was not sure because i was told at some point that inmates are provided with laptops by the department so I just wanted to check that at what level, but I understand there was a court case uh, ruling there. And then what shocked me, uh, maybe the officials there can assist me, was to say, what do, you, what do you do to make sure that that laptop cannot be used for illegal activities? G4S says, no, we just check if it does not have an external modem. I mean, those are things of 2004 when Tabo Pesta went to jail or before he was arrested. My understanding, well, the, 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 the officials, they will comment. My understanding is that if you have a, a, a laptop that is equipped with uh, Wi-Fi capacity, all Tabo Pesta needed was a cell phone, which was found in there, with, with data. He creates a, a personal hotspots, and he does his trading and his criminal activities from there. Any comment? I agree with the observation, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and that's why uh, we were able to, to deal with the matter in our investigation report, and that's why the, the investigation report is recommending that um, we issue penalties, and uh, that's why at the moment we have taken uh, a temporary management, or we appointed a temporary manager uh, so that we can be able to uh, enhance the security in the in uh, MMC. Can, can Ch we Ch then Ch agree Ch that Ch uh, okay. Minister wants to come in. Honorable Minister. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Chairperson. <coughs> Just to add to the response of the National Commissioner is that uh, you will remember that the inspecting judge said that there's a matter in the Supreme Court of Appeal because what provide for the inmates to have this kind of facility was that there is a policy of the department that allows them and the act that says they must study and so forth. But that policy does not say they must have laptops in their cells. It does not allow that. But there is a, co a, a high court judgment that then said they must have access to the laptop 
in their cells if they are studying. So that is what we are now appealing because we don't agree and we agree with the uh, honorable causa that if someone has a, self, a, a laptop in his or her cell and have a, with the development of technology and have a cell phone with a, the high level of smuggling, anything is possible. So that's why there's that appeal in the Supreme Court of Appeal on that judgment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Koza. Minister, for agreeing with me that uh, Basta was allowed to carry on his criminal activities right under the nose of, 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 of uh, uh, G4S. It was, uh, he was either deliberately enabled or they were sleeping on the job. That, 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 that is, is obvious. The next question I would want to ask, um, Best, uh, when he committed these heinous crimes against women, he was par on parole for fraud. He's a fraudster, this one. When he comes in here, the first thing that you should say, uh, close the, all the possibilities of fraudulent activities. He gets a cell phone in his cell. He gives a name that cannot be verified. He carries on a trading. I would, expect, I would have expected that an extra care, particularly in the issues of technology, would have been taken to, to, to ensure that uh, I mean, Basta does not carry on with his activities. However, my question is this. I was just commenting. My question is, when he was paroled, can you confirm that his parole was genuine or it was bought? Because for one to be able to pull such a, a, a huge scam right under uh, everybody's nose is either he's extremely connected or he is moneyed. So can we go back to his parole for the initial fraud? Surely his fraud had to do with money. So this boy has always been moneyed from, 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 from the look of things. Can you confirm that his parole was genuine or you're not sure whether it was bought or genuine? Any comment? I can confirm, Honorable Chairperson, through you, that this parole was genuine. Based on? Based on parole processes that are independent of influence from the department, based on the um, sentence plan that would have been uh, implemented, um, and of course, um, as I've indicated, um, based on the, the system itself, the parole system. Um, can we rule out influence of money? You are saying it's independent without influence, but can we rule out influence of money in the parole system? Can you stand here firm and say, I am ruling out the possibility of the influence of money? in the parole system, Commission. Through you, Honorable Chairperson, if there are instances uh, like those, they are reported and we deal with them. But I would not uh, sit here and, and, and speculate whether there's influence of money or not. What I'm definitely saying is that uh, our parole processes are above board. If there is a, a, an allegation of corruption or any type of influence that is driven by financial gain, uh, that can be brought before us. We'll look into that and we'll attend to it. Uh, two minutes left. Uh, Chair, I want to move to quickly to the, trace and, uh, the track and trace team. Uh, who, who, who made up the uh, uh, track and trace team? Were there private security companies involved? Uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson, there were no private security companies involved. The track and tracing team was made up of officials of government, Thank mainly you. The, the, from the correctional are, services. OK, no, that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll check on that. The partners in the consortium each have got 20%. Uh, you said that there are attachments to this report. Uh, is there an attachment to this report that you said will be made available? That, state, uh, that breaks down each and every party to the consortium in terms of who are the registered directors, et cetera, et cetera, giving uh, specific details. Is that uh, in your report or not there? 
Uh, that breakdown is not in the report. It's the breakdown that we will provide to the committee through you, Honorable Chairperson. Okay, no, thank you it's a very much. I would love to do that. In closing, uh, uh, this I'm directing to, to the minister. M uh, Mr. Minister, our prisons have a population of uh, 1, uh, 157,135, an overcrowding of 44.42%. It, 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 it means they contain more than double the amount, almost more than double the amount that they're supposed to contain. Is that in line with the uh, best international practices? Maybe I can throw in this one so that you can get a chance to respond because the chair will cut me. Is that in line with the uh, 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 international standards uh, and best, best practices? Maybe let me stop there for now. Thank you, so that you can be able to respond. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Chairperson. As you are aware, the prisons are governed by the, national, the, by the Nelson Mandela rules uh, of um, treatment of inmates and so forth. It is not in line, but there is no country in the world that does not have overcrowding. It's just a degree of um, overcrowding. Maybe there could be one or two, but it's a general norm across the globe. Overcrowding is a challenge for all states. And um, with us, it has been proven over time that we may not be able to develop infrastructure at the same pace as the courts are convicting people. Hence, this private-public partnership arrangement was conceptualized at the time to help with the situation of over overcrowding and to build bed space capacity within a very short period of time. And we can say that was achieved because almost 5,000 bed and space within a short period of time was done. Um, we have the benefit of the infrastructure. The issue is whether uh, in terms of the operating contracts, the crews which were struggling to, to sustain. And it is for that reason that we do not want to continue with this model. And we announced earlier because we felt that uh, it's not sustainable on our side. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister. On a light note, are you saying that there is overcrowding at Vat Vatican City? <laughs> no, I don't want to be accused of blasphemy, Chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> One question that arises of, out of what uh, Honorable Koza has said. With all the lapses that happened, especially with the issues of computer and internet, don't you think that those are some of the things that might also contribute or might have contributed in us getting grey listed? If you have security uh, facilities that are so vulnerable, uh, that can also be vulnerable to money laundering and even terrorist planning, don't you think that that is a potential threat to national security and even how international world sees us? Yeah, uh, Chairperson, uh, you, you will remember that uh, on the issues of grey listing, they did point to the issues that we must attend to, uh, money wiring, fraud, laundering, that as and when it happens, it must be followed up, there must be arrest, it must be nipped as quickly as possible. So, and it is within the context of safety and security that uh, you will have seen from the presentation that we are in engagement with the CSIR to help us to deal with this thing of the cell phones in the, in the facilities. While we have the technology to detect, for example, um, like uh, in, uh, in Mangao, in Hoshimampur, and others of our facilities, but the human element always comes in, where there is this contraband smuggling and so forth. So that's why we're looking at CSIR to help us to develop a system that can enable us to block um, and so forth. And also, while we comply with the laws, uh, ICASA regulations and so forth, because uh, f some of the issues that ar arose is that if you block, you might block the entire place and co communities. Because if you remember, the correctional facilities 
There are also families that reside there and so forth. So it might block everyone from communicating. So it affects also the ICASA regulations. So we we'll need also to apply with ICASA. But what I can assure the committee is that there is work that we are doing with the CSIR to find a technology solution to this challenge of uh, uh, cell phones or communications with the outside world by the inmates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Janja. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, that seems uh, the end. It's late in the evening, Chair, and I have a, I'm in a position that I don't like because I have, I have two, two risks I'm starting with that I would have uh, missed um, the question posed and the interaction to, um, to allow my role of pick it up uh, at the end. And, and the second risk is that I might be repeating things. And, and for that, Chair, to apologize, I think I did indicate to you uh, I had to attend a, an urgent matter that uh, I needed to attend. Um, and and I would like, I'll, I'll, I'll therefore, as a way of uh, not keeping everybody, perhaps to, to limit uh, the issues. And maybe National Commissioner, if we can walk back before you took over as a, as a National Commissioner uh, in this space, whether it's a BCC or MCC, my understanding is that there was a, there would have been an investigation that was done which involves your human rights uh, people, uh, Commissioner Chris Nissan, and the department, and out of that, there would have been a report that would have been compiled. Um, as part of the handover and what you inherited, are you aware of that report? I am aware of the report, and uh, I must also indicate through you, Honorable Chairperson, that. Uh, uh, there was no handover. Uh, <laughs> it is the, the, the reports that you would be aware of as you continue to do your work and you try and, and see how you then accommodate the recommendations and what has been done uh, from, the, from what comes out of those reports and you include that in improving the environment as you move on. No, thank you. Fair, I, I accept that, you know, and it's not only in that space. Um, we, in, the, in this room, we're talking about uh, tensions of handover, so it seems to be inherent uh, in, in, in this. Um, but I do know, just to, to go back to, to the handover, uh, even a few days ago, I was reading, I have it at home, I was reading this handover report by the previous National Commissioner. It's in a document. So I don't know who, who, who it was given to. Uh, but I was browsing this handover report. But I'm not going to go there, uh, since you indicated that there was no proper handover. But the issue I, I, I'm going back to, to start with, is that report that you are aware would have had recommendations of things that needed to be done. Uh, and, and having taken over, are you able to talk to us about uh, the implementation of those recommendations? Because it's a report that would have spoken, again, I'm staying on my issue chair, the report would have spoken on the systematic deficiencies, uh, including issues of personnel, in the space that we're talking about. Um, whatever it's imperfections and limitations, uh, but it, it, it had recommendations that needed to be attended to. Um, some would have included um, 
in relation to this contract and this concession, the who the director was part of this supervisory committee and so on, and, and a lot of others. So my question to start is, have those recommendations been implemented? Um, through you, Honorable Chairperson, um, I did indicate in my uh, first answer that uh, I am aware of the reports, including the handover report of the former National Commissioner. The process is what I alluded to when I was talking about the handover process. Um, and, um, and I indicated also in my previous answer that in uh, um, assessing whether those recommendations were implemented, one looked at the improvements that were put into the system. Um, and earlier on in the discussion, I can just give an example. One of those was to make it a point that the supervisor committee works. And uh, the, the challenge there was that a member of the supervisor committee who's an external member resigned yeah. and uh, when the former national commissioner left he had started a process of appointment of the external uh, uh, member of the supervisory committee we went through the process we couldn't get the correct candidate where to re-advertise again so uh, there are those specifics where one would say that we were able to to implement the recommendations earlier on i spoke to the fact that through the that um, uh, and over report, there was a recommendation that in as much as you have got a contractual control and, mm. uh, and management process that is um, in the hands of the director contract management, we need to make it a point that at an operational level, there is a way for the reports on operations to come through to the management of correctional services. Hence, we then opened a line through the region that when they give us statistics and, and reports on, on, on a, a operational matters, they must also include Mangaung. Even on our performance with regards to the annual report, we include Mangaung as part of the region, Free State, Northern Cape. And I did indicate also that on a weekly basis when we review the incidents, Mangaung is also included, MCC is also included. So it is out of those recommendations from uh, the handover report by the former National Commissioner, but also an, a specific investigation report that was uh, uh, um, produced through the work that uh, was done at Mangaung. There was a time that the department spent uh, more than a month at Mangaung through different interventions led by, by, by the former National uh, Commissioner. Um, and that has, that even led to the appointment of a chief deputy commissioner responsible for incarceration, incarceration and corrections as the overall overseer of the the two uh, triple uh, P contracts. And that is where also the initial idea of looking at a takeover uh, came through. Thank you for that response, uh, NC. Maybe just before we leave there, can you then, in your own way, summarize and say, these were the recommendations, I'm, I'm looking for a scorecard here, that these were recommendations that uh, you, you inherited and compared to what we have today and what we're dealing with in relation to this particular issue. Are you in a position to say, there's one or two areas where we would have done better in relation to those recommendations. Or are, are you uh, of the view that uh, you have gone beyond that and you have actually uh, become even better innovative? So that we leave that point. I, I want to be satisfied uh, in, 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 in that. Um. Through you, Honorable Chairperson, uh, one of the areas uh, of weakness, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that uh, we have to attend to, is the annual reviews. Because as the supervisory committee meets to, to, to deal with the, um, the penalties um, that would have been imposed, every year um, 
there has to be an annual review of the contract. And that is what has, has, has not been done. And that is what we, we need to do. Chair, as I leave that point, just as a small commentary. Uh, thank you, uh, National Commissioner. This point is important because even across departments, uh, every year you've got uh, action list and recommendations of the Auditor General. And, 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 and there gets to be no attention to these issues and we go back to the next process and deal with the same problems. Uh, so it, it is important that uh, when you deal with this issue, the w looking back and walking back is important so that we are, we are able to close those gaps. But uh, I'm satisfied with the response. The, the next point perhaps to, to invite the minister here. Um, what has been demonstrated in the last two days and, and I just want your comment, uh, Minister. What has been demonstrated in the last two days is a, is a silo approach between the different role players in this security setup. Um, it's, not, it's not even a silo. It's littered with tensions and everything else um, at the expense of work uh, being done. Um, demonstrated in, in, in feet dragging, blame game. We have listened to the reports here. The, those themes run through. And, 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 and so the issue for me to, to get to the minister perhaps commenting on this, um, because in this space, all of these role players needed to be coordinated uh, by a particular uh, center. Uh, are, are you happy that uh, we are going to be closing these two days having received these reports and uh, we are seeing uh, these gaps of uh, almost lack of cooperation on, 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 on this administration of justice in, in, in these corrections and, and some of the essential issues that, that we have seen? Yeah, it, it is for that reason, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Janju, that you will have heard me saying, for example, tomorrow Home Affairs will be giving a briefing on the issue of the national identification. It's, it's because when we realize that the, there is no proper coordination, um, we then coordinated that. And uh, since that coordination started uh, uh, in um, late March, there has been a lot of um, uh, improvement uh, between the various uh, security cluster departments. And I think the experience we are gaining from this, we will obviously have to enhance it in the cluster coordination uh, overall. Thanks, Minister. Maybe to go back to the NC, there are a lot of loopholes in the system that has been demonstrated here by various reports. Um, in particular, because the core mandate of this department is rehabilitation. That's the core, because that's why it's, it's correctional centers and not prisons. Um, but the biggest budget item of this is incarceration. Uh, if you have a budget of 25 billion, about 15 billion, it was 15.1 billion this year. That just goes on to one program, incarceration, uh, less than what it was in the previous year. And yet what we have been dealing with here in the last two days, is about problems in that program. Which, was, which makes me to argue that the problem is not money. The biggest source of money is thrown into this program, but we remain with problems. How to fix that? Um, um, through you, um, Honorable Chairperson, I agree that we are investing um, 
the uh, quite a sizable or biggest chunk of the budget of the department on incarceration um, because we have to create conditions that are you know humane and safe for for offenders um, but we are doing that at the backdrop of uh, uh, the issue that was discussed before the issue of overcrowding and its impact uh, the issue of the the state of our correctional facilities, almost uh, all of them cannot even carry the numbers that they are carrying uh, because they are outrightly you know, dilapidated. We are talking at the backdrop of uh, a ratio of uh, correctional security officials that is way lower than it's supposed to be against the ratio of uh, the offenders that we're dealing with. We're talking about applying that budget on a profile of offenders that has changed over years. Actually, the number of uh, offenders that are, are saving life has, tra has dramatically increased now. Um, and hence, we are not getting the value for money that we're supposed to be getting. The system itself, I would say, suffocates the, um, the interventions that we are implementing in the incarceration space. Now, um, if we were to move more of the funds into rehabilitation would uh, actually be weakening the impact of rehabilitation. And mm -hmm. I, can, I can give an example to that. If we are to take offenders to the, the, the farm to go and uh, you know, uh, you know, practice their skills on agriculture, um, you need to have security officers there and agricultural technicians. Mm -hmm. Now, we just had an escape uh, last week in Brantford, where two offenders escaped uh, when they were at the farm. They were looked after by two officials, and those offenders were around 37. And, and that's, those are the types of ratios that I'm talking about, and that's why every time we make this submission to National Treasury that the more you have the success of the criminal justice system, giving us more offenders to look after, with this mandate that we need to incarcerate them under humane, and safe conditions and at the same time rehabilitate them. Please be aware of the fact that when we increase the numbers on the side of the police, when we increase the numbers on the side of prosecutors, you also need to look at the, 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 the budgetary needs of the Department of Correctional Services, and that's a reality. Now, you have a situation where the, the whole value chain succeeds up to a point where uh, we have these offenders in our facilities. But I'm talking about those that are inside the facilities. We have a, a, another big problem is, which is, of, which is uh, the offenders that are now in the parole system that would need to be monitored on a regular basis. And when you look at the numbers that are monitoring these uh, this, uh, this offenders, and again we go back to the profile, uh, and these this, this matters are not reported uh, too widely in, in any case in the media. We have our, our officials getting shot at by, by parolees because those uh, offenders that would have been paroled, uh, having served their sentences, end up you know, uh, with a community that presents them with challenges and they ended up going up back to the, to the crime rings and all. So it's a, it's a, it's a really involved and deep-seated problem that we will not be able to, to, to deal with as the correctional system yeah, I, alone. I, 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 I need I, that alignment. I like, what I'm, I like what I'm hearing, but uh, I'm going to stop it. I like what I'm hearing, and, 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 and hopefully you are going to chair, we are going to interact, because as I, as I, as I end, um, the chairperson is, is, a, is a champion, and we are in the, in the same space of, an, of this issue of saying to treasure and everybody else, they must stop these budget cuts in the security cluster. Because before you grow it, you've got to stop first the budget cuts. So you, you're, speaking to the, you're speaking to the converted. Uh, but I've not heard that, what you're saying today, in terms of how we deal with that. But the question that comes when you put that on the table, and I'll demonstrate with what comes out of your report, is an argument that says, have one minute. Yes, you can't deal and manage even what you have. Here you have presented to us 18 breaches of a contract, one eight. 18 breaches, you've listed all of them. Um, besides you seeking legal opinion, 
I have not heard you being, you don't seem shocked um, by the 18 breaches. I mean, in any standard, anywhere, in a contractual relationship, that you have these 18 breaches, supposed to mean that there's, there's a non-existence of this relationship. What is your take about this? You've listed them to us, unless you wanted us to just know. What does this mean in relation to, as we live here today, these 18 breaches still exist tonight in, at MCC in the manner that you have listed them? What are you saying to this committee? And, and that's where I'm landing, Chair. Thank you, National Commissioner. Yeah. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, the current state of affairs at MMC, or, yeah, Mangaung Correctional Center, is that the director who was responsible for managing that center has been removed and we've installed a temporary manager. Now, we installed a temporary manager after less than 10 days of receiving this report of these bridges. Um, we received the report on the 22nd and we installed the temporary manager on the 30th of March. And we, we presented to the uh, portfolio committee a, a plan that we are implementing on how we are addressing those security bridges, including look, uh, re looking at the issue of the fact that some of the cameras do not cover uh, uh, the extent at which they are supposed to cover, including ensuring that we improve the technology there so that you don't have uh, any person uh, having the ability to switch on, switch off, or change the direction of cameras. Those are the issues that we, are, we will address. Um, and uh, I would say that we acted with the, the required speech, and uh, um, G4S uh, is saying that uh, we are not supposed to be there. They have taken us on a, on a, legal, uh, uh, on a legal route and we've responded to that because we are convinced that what we are doing is correct. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. No, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, I would not say that we have come to the conclusion of our meeting. Uh, we are just going to adjourn or take a pause, as Honorable Janji always say. Um, one, we have been, we have received some documents um, from G4S that we need to go through. Uh, Mr. Ramano here was very fascinated by this document. Uh, he has been taking quite a lot of things. Um, that he thinks that they need to be looked at. So we would need time to look at this document. And in addition to that, I think there were other additional, in fact, there's other additional information that members requested today. We will need to get that information also. Um, then as a committee, we will sit and after we have gone through the relevant information um, to say what is our next course of action, do we invite um, G4S or anybody who is here for further information uh, in the form of a meeting? Are we going to be satisfied with the information that we would have read uh, in the documentation that we we'll have received. Uh, there was also a request that I think that was made by Honorable Breitenbach, uh, and it, I think there was no objection to that request, uh, that uh, we need to hear from the technicians from Intergron, uh, not the people who were here. Um, we will still have to discuss how do we process that, which means that uh, we will have to find time uh, in our program, parliamentary program, um, outside of constituency period. Um, 
so and then outside of the budget process because we have a seriously congested budget uh, process um, things as they are now we will be debating the office of the chief justice what is the date on the 9th which means we should have already had budget hearings of the office of the chief justice we need to meet with the chief justice on the 5th uh, we've got 10 other entities to meet. Um, we've got pressing legislation, including JIGS one, that we need to take a position as to um, whether we would allow all the cabinet processes or we would uh, have to take a, part, a different uh, a route. So we'll take all of those things into consideration and read the information before us. Um, after that, we can have proper deliberations because uh, the report out of this process would need to go to the House for uh, for a, a report and debate. So we would need to have um, clear recommendations to the House. So we can't go to the House with half-baked information. So we, ne we will need to be, uh, to be sure that the information we have to the best of our knowledge uh, is the information that we are satisfied that uh, we can advise the House uh, properly. But I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody, to thank the ministers, deputy ministers, the judge, all the senior officials that are here from all the departments, uh, members for <laughs> good behavior. Uh, generally, yes, there were those exceptions. Uh, there were those exceptions. We would, we would improve on those exceptions. Uh, but thank you very much. This is an, a process that was necessary. It's a process, in fact, what happened goes to the heart of the challenges that faces our country. As parliament, we had to pass three GPV bills within a short space of time because women of our country are being killed. They are being, uh, I mean, there's, all, there's a lot of violence emotionally and otherwise, uh, but more importantly, there is physical violence on, on, on women of our country. So the country is under threat. So when this thing happened, all of us felt threatened. Not only women of our country, but they are part of us. When they get raped, it's part of who we are. These are our mothers, these are our sisters, these are our wives, these are our girlfriends. So this, they are part of who we are. So for spending all this time trying to to, to go to the root of the problem was not a time wasted. But also I would like to thank you for the spirit with which you have, uh, you have uh, participated in this meeting. Uh, sometimes it was a little bit hot, um, but there was also a lot of humor. Uh, the minister was very humorous. Uh, with <laughs> I won't repeat it. <laughs> Others, uh, there's another one that is trending on the social media. Uh, what is it? No, that's not the other one. Yeah, the other ones that I'm a South African by a criminal record. 
<laughs> so it's a ngesixhosa bathi eh uyahlekwa noba sekufikwa noba sekubhujiwa thank you very much uh, colleagues so we will uh, inform everybody if there's a need to meet again but there will be i think the intergron intergriton uh, would need us to to have a further meeting um, we might uh, give other people to maybe to to do some rebuttals um, but that will be communicated to to all of you so i hope that uh, g4s you were heavily entertained um, uh, here uh, there is no need for summons. These are very warm people. It's good company to have. So next time, I think uh, uh, an invitation will suffice. Uh, Intergriton also wanted to join G4S. We are coming, but would like to be summons. Uh, I, I, I think you stayed with us for two days very warm environment. It's just uh, accountability in action because that is one of the tenets of our democracy. Thank you very much.